Hi, this is Eric from longboxreview.com. Welcome to the show. 2020 is the 10th anniversary of the Long Box Review podcast, and to celebrate this milestone, I have chosen 10 episodes to spotlight. These episodes have some importance to me, or I just like them a lot. I hope you enjoy these retrosodes as much as I did making them. Thank you for your support over these 10 years. For this eighth retrosode, I am rebroadcasting the first Christmas Gab Bag episode I did with George from the Meanwhile at the Podcast show. This was originally released December 18th, 2017, and George and I have done this annual celebration two more times in December, with last year's being hosted by George on his show, which makes this the second podcast crossover I've done with George, uh, the previous being our discussion about the War of Jokes and Riddles story in Batman. I had a lot of fun talking about Christmas-themed or adjacent comics with a fellow comic book geek, and while it's not Christmas time, I hope you can derive some joy out of this conversation. God knows we all need some joy right now. Thanks for listening. Hi, this is Eric from longboxreview.com. Welcome to the show. Uh, Today I have a a special end-of-the-year episode for us, and uh, we're going to be talking about some Christmas comics, and joining me for this conversation is George from the now-defunct George and Tony Entertainment Show. Hey, George. Hey, Eric. Merry Christmas to you. Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas, George. Thanks for uh, 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 opting to join me here. I I know that uh, you are uh, recovering from some dental stuff. Oh, yes. uh, I appreciate you taking the time to, to talk some comics with me today. Anytime I can talk comics with you, Eric, is is a great day for me especially Christmas <laughs> comics. I love Christmas comics. Yeah. So, uh so I w- I want to remind our our uh, our listeners here that uh see this 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 whole idea of talking about some Christmas comics uh came out of uh I think a couple different conversations that we've had over the last year essentially, but back on episode 106 of of my show George joined me back in October of 2016 to discuss the October 2016 previews in which there were a bunch of holiday themed comics. And, and and we talked a lot about uh, things that people could get as gifts for, for Christmas time and whatnot. And I remember thinking, George, uh, as we approached uh, October again, I wanted to get you back on and do the same exact thing. And then next thing I knew, it was already November. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, saving grace here, thanks to George, uh, during one of our recording sessions from one of the the, the previous episodes that you've been on, uh, I think you brought up uh, this very idea of, of talking about some Christmas to- uh, comics at this time. Cool. And I'm glad you took me up on it. Yeah, this is this was a lot of fun. I I, I went through my my uh, list. I checked it twice or some <laughs> such, and uh, <laughs> found some. Uh, uh, I went through all the uh, the holiday. Well, what I did, George, is I went through my 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 program that I have all my comics cataloged in, searched mm-hmm. for Christmas, and I found a good I don't know dozen or so, and I went through all those as we were preparing for this and, and um, uh, got the number down to three that I wanted to talk about with you. I know you have some. And uh, we'll we'll get to those in a second, but uh, I did I did mention at the top of the show, uh, I, uh, the now defunct George and Tony Entertainment Show, and uh, I, I'm sorry to report to my listeners who who may not have caught up on the news, George, but you have ended the George and Tony Entertainment Show. Yes, Tony and I have ended the show after 200 episodes. Uh, if, if anybody ever took a chance on listening to my show, even if it was just when Eric was on, you may have realized that Tony wasn't around, especially this year. So to have a show where half of the people whose names are in the title aren't there, it's a little weird and it's a little challenging to put out a weekly podcast on time when there's only two of you and one person isn't there and you have to find cordial guest hosts like yourself to come on and uh, f- fill in for Tony. The it, the gag, I guess, ran a little thin early in the year, but I kept it going. Yeah, you did. Uh, and I, I, the question was, when would I stop? Because I knew Tony wasn't <laughs> coming back for any length of – he wasn't going to come back at all. 
it, to get him to come back even for one episode was a twist of the arm. Mm -hmm. And as I said on episode 200, or maybe even said it on 199, just to set up that 200 was going to be the last episode, I'm kind of a completist and a numerologist, but uh, I like holiday-themed episodes, just like I like holiday-themed comics. I wanted to record around the holidays, but everybody's busy. So, for instance, it might have been hard to get you to come on as a guest co-host or some of my other guest co-hosts. Tony wasn't if i got lucky to get him for 200 trust me and uh, i i love the olympics i would love to be recording when the olympics are on in february but that's three months from now you know i just i couldn't see going another three months without tony keeping a show with tony's name in the title and he's not there mm -hmm. 200 was a nice round number especially for us comic guys right to end a series on <laughs> something that's a multiple of 50 right yeah, so I shot for 200. It worked out great. The 200th episode posted the Monday after the Thanksgiving holiday. Yeah. Kind of a nice time to end because everybody, even even podcasts like yours, Eric, you guys may be taking a little bit of, of a break for the holidays. So I think a lot of listeners are used to, which is unfortunate, but they're used to their podcast content being a little different this time of year anyway. Mm -hmm. So I figured it was a good time. Number 200, the timing was right. And uh, now I get to be on shows like yours as a guest, uh, try and bully my way in to other shows if I can, <laughs> just to keep those podcasting chops nice and fresh. Yeah, yeah. You got you to gotta keep, uh, keep in shape. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, people don't know this, but my Skype connection and my call recorder totally screwed us up tonight. And I think that's just because it's been idle for so long. Uh, uh, and it didn't know what to do when I fired it back up today. I I I, I hear you. I feel your pain, George, because as mm -hmm. you well know, I'm I'm, ha I'm having a bit of difficulty with my recording software for some strange reason. Um, but uh, we're, we're soldiering on, as it mm -hmm. were, and uh, hopefully we'll <laughs> not encounter any more issues. But uh, uh, I just want to I just want to say, George, um, a couple things. One. Uh, People, well, one, people should go listen to your show. It's still available. It's, it, even though you've stopped recording any new shows, it's still yes. going to be available. People can go download all of your episodes. And there's a lot of great content out there. Uh, George has, has a lot of good interviews, uh, in, including a lot of people who work in comics. And, uh, and sometimes he, he, for some reason, thought it'd be a good idea to bring on people like myself and, and talk about comics. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and, you know, we, you've, you had me on your show. I, I counted it up and unless I miscounted, uh, I've been on a total of 10 times. That's right. Uh, you were. Yeah. And, and I really appreciate that. Uh, most of that was from the, from 2017. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we've had a good long year of, of getting together on your show and talking about comics and other things. And, uh, your, your episode 200, George, uh, I, I don't know whose idea it was to do what you did with, with Tony and Greg Shegel. I mean, I was just, I, when I heard Greg Shegel talking on there as the, the, the interviewer slash moderator with, and, and just the way you guys did that, it's, it, I loved it. It was brilliant. Um, I think people will, they really should go listen to a bunch of your episodes. If they haven't already start from the beginning and work your way through, but man, you got to get to episode 200 because <laughs> it was, it was so much fun. And I'm glad you mentioned that. Thank you for mentioning that. If only to give me an opportunity to thank Greg Shegel, who's been on your show before too, mm -hmm. uh, the creator of the Pix graphic novels. And he's a frequent contributor on SpongeBob comics. Uh, he was gracious enough to host he was the host for the 200th episode of the George and Tony Entertainment Show. And that was really nice of him to do that. Obviously, he didn't have to do it. He was very kind to do it. And it, it took him some time. You, you know, we, it, it wasn't a one-day affair. And uh, I think it worked out very well. I, I love that episode. If, if all our episodes could have been like that, uh, well, it would have been a totally different show. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we're, we're all very proud of uh, episode 200 of the George and Tony Entertainment Show. And... Thank you for mentioning that the archives are going to remain out there. Uh, we still have a relationship with the Realm Network. Uh, the George and Tony domain name, uh, I don't know who has it now, but I don't. So don't go to georgeandtony.com anymore. Go to realmnetwork.com, click on the George and Tony banner, 
and our archives are there, and you could sample some of the other shows on the Realm Network. And uh, Eric, may I may I put in another plug here, real quick? Go right ahead. You don't have a relationship with Amazon, do you? No. Okay. Not, other than being a a a, uh, a buyer. <laughs> okay. Well, then I implore your listeners because not only are we on the Realm Network, but we're on iTunes. But iTunes doesn't keep the full catalog out there. I think they only have the last 100 or 150 episodes. So you would, wouldn't would have an opportunity to grab them all unless you went to uh, realmnetwork.com or georgeantony.libson.com so you can grab all the episodes if you wanted to go way back to see the origins of the George and Tony Entertainment Show. But we, re- we retain our relationship with the Realm Network because hopefully I will be part of a new project in 2018 and they have been kind enough to host that show, whatever it may be. And like I said on episode 200, one of the stipulations was that I not be a part of that new show. I don't know how that's going to work, (laughs) but they have been kind enough to hold that spot for us. So they're leaving the George and Tony entertainment show up so people can guide themselves through it. Maybe get to know me, get to know Tony. I want them to get to know Tony. And unfortunately, Tony won't be part of the new project, but uh, they've been kind enough to leave that there and they've got a spot for whatever new project I've got in 2018 to show them that people are hitting the site though, since it is the holidays, I would ask if you are going to do any shopping through Amazon, please use the link on the George and Tony entertainment show page at realmnetwork.com. And I, I implore you to do this because I know we all listen to a lot of podcasts and a lot of those podcasts probably have Amazon as part of their money-making stream. Well, they probably also have a Patreon, some other sponsors, uh, a PayPal thing that you can do for them, and other. maybe they might even have merchandise. All we ever had was Amazon. And if you are going to venture out to listen to any of our archives at realmnetwork.com, it would be nice that they could see that not only in the numbers, but maybe seeing that the Amazon sales related to our show were at least consistent throughout the holidays. Obviously, I expect a big drop. I'd be surprised if anybody did it, but I do have to ask. It helps to let them know that people are still discovering the show or at least going out there to sample it and say, you know, I did hear these episodes with Eric, but who is Tony? What's going on here? And they might be interested to check that out. Yeah. And if you want to hear Eric's episodes, they are 98, 155, get a pen, 164, <laughs> 166, 173, 179, 182, where you can learn about Eric because we don't talk about comics at all in that episode. 185, which is part one of a two part discussion of the recent Batman story, The War of Jokes and Riddles. Do you remember the episode of your show that was part two of that? Uh, I think it's 127, I want to okay. say. Okay. That, that was a true. Uh, Industry crossover right there. Yeah. Episode 190, Eric started to talk about Rose City Comic Con before he dedicated an entire long box review to it. So that's almost like a crossover right there. And then episode 192, we had the podcast Trinity of you, me, and Peter Rios, mm-hmm. your co-host on the Legion Project. The Legion Project, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So, so go find those episodes if nothing else, folks. And, and if people uh, would like, they could go to, to longboxreview.com and click the appearances button on the page and i have all those episodes listed as well okay so george um shall we shall we talk about christmas some christmas comics yeah let's do it man this this was really fun uh i I had a good time with this i really did all right so we have we we've we've each uh chosen a few comics that we're going to talk about and i will let my guest go first george what is your first comic that you want to talk about all right. First of all, we have, let's set the ground rules here for everybody. These are uh, comics from the past. Nothing that's that's out now, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. And and by the past, it could be last year or decades ago, and anywhere in between. <laughs> As anybody could tell from the uh, the uh, spiel I gave you before we started this discussion, right now, I'm a little long winded, and I apologize for that. But I will go as quickly as I can here. I am not as organized as Eric is. When Eric and I were discussing recording this episode, he sent me a screen print of the software that he uses. I don't know what you use, Eric, 
to maintain uh, any sort of semblance of organization of your comic collection. And I was very impressed by that. I used to be that way too, before I moved from New York to Virginia. When I was in New York, I could tell you what box had whatever in it. Now that I've been in Virginia all these years, I don't know where anything is. So I started to panic. It's like you live in the wilderness, George. Yeah, well, uh, boxes, a uh, wilderness of boxes is what it, <laughs> long boxes, which have not been reviewed in a while. You see what I did there? Mm. I got nervous that I wouldn't be able to find a Christmas comic, old, a, well, a holiday themed comic older than last year. I happened to be at my local comic shop, went through their dollar bin, and I saw an issue of Fantastic Four, Volume 2, Number 4, that had a Christmas-themed cover. And I said, oh, this is perfect. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick this up. I don't have this. I never read this. This will be new to me. And this fits. And in case I can't find my stuff, at least I've got one. Eric, I was bamboozled. And that might be a theme for my Christmas comics uh, for for this show. Now, I'm, I, I was a, as a, as a kid. Were you a fan of the Archie uh, Christmas grab bag or whatever it used to be called, and the Betty Veronica stocking stuffer or whatever it was called, or the old uh, Disney Christmas uh, compilations that would come out? I was aware of them, but I never actually mm-hmm. got to read any. E- e- either type the Archie or the Disney. No, no. Oh, really? Oh, that's interesting to hear. I, I used to a, love that. I was that a poor stuff. boy from Idaho who didn't have any money to buy comics until he was much older. <laughs> well, the funny thing is, when I did go through my own boxes, and I'm jumping ahead here a little bit, what did I find? I found Archie's and I found uh, the Disney stuff. And I said, you know what? I'm going to put that aside. Let me see what else I could find. And I kept digging and I found some of those old DC holiday specials, mm-hmm. the ones from the 80s. They still do them now, but the ones from the 80s. And I said to myself, you know what? I'll bet you Eric might pull one of these out. I'm going to see if I could <laughs> dig a little deeper and find something else. So I did find other things, but I would like to start with the Fantastic Four story, if I may. Now, I've got notes here. In fact, where the heck are they? Sorry, Eric. Oh, there, there they are. Label page one. Okay. Fantastic Four, volume two, number four. This was uh, that part of the time where Onslaught uh, attacked all the heroes and they had the re- heroes reborn, reborn uh, thing going okay. on. Yeah. The funny thing was on issue number four of the Fantastic Four, the heroes reborn logo wasn't up there. So I guess they didn't keep that logo very long like they're doing, say, with Rebirth right now. Ah, uh, okay. I was a little surprised about that. That, that, that wasn't the case. Uh, the cover date is uh, February 1997, the 90s, with Jim Lee plotting and penciling, Brandon Choi doing the script, and Scott Williams on inks. And it's got a cover by uh, Will Sport. Am I pronouncing his name right? Will Sportico? That's how I always pronounce it. I mean, it's probably pronounced different, differently. Yeah, I'm not sure about that one. All right. Now, okay, Eric, this is where I got bamboozled. Okay, you ready for this? The Invisible Woman's on the cover. It's a total 90s objectification of women. She's she's there in a Santa Claus outfit that's so low cut. <laughs> and and she's in the foreground and there's a, a Christmas there's a Christmas tree in the background, Mr. Fantastic's decorating the tree, the thing's got a big bag of goodies on his back. There is nothing in this comic book that has to do with Christmas. Not a one. But I kept it on my list because it had the Christmas cover. And I wanted to show that I got bamboozled. So this is this is like thank you 90s. Okay, this is not only is it a Fantastic Four comic that teases that there might be something to do with Christmas in it. But it's a late 90s Heroes Reborn Fantastic Four issue. Even though it doesn't have anything to do with Christmas, I am briefly going to talk about it because some of the things in here just uh, are. I don't know if it's typical 90s. This is about the time where I was going cold turkey on comics. Uh, I, I I was in the period of be- we were engaged. We weren't married yet. I had stopped reading diligently probably a year or two prior. And at this point in my life, I really wasn't reading at all. So this is my cold turkey period. I never read any of the Heroes Reborn stuff. Did you ever get into that stuff? 
I totally missed all that. I, I was aware of it, but uh, I wasn't reading a whole lot of Marvel comics at that time. Mm. And so, yeah, I, I, I totally missed it. So I'm, I'm anxious to hear what you have to say about this. I'm, I'm not quite sure you missed anything. Well, I'm going to make it fast since it really isn't <laughs> Christmas themed except for the cover. And, you know, I'm looking all over. Can you show me a wreath? Something. Uh, candles. Anything that has to do with the holidays. You teased me on the cover and I realized they had nothing. So, again, bamboozled. Thank you, 90s. Thank you, Marvel. No wonder you guys almost went bankrupt. <laughs> Something really bad happens on page one in Wakanda. Ooh, Wakanda. Well, kind of topical these days with the Black Panther movie coming up. Mm -hmm. Then you turn the page and 14-year-old year girls are going gaga over Johnny Storm's body and his celebrity, oh but mostly gosh. his body. Uh. And these 14-year-old girls, if he didn't say... I'm being chased by 14-year-old girls a la the Beatles in A Hard, Day, uh, a Hard Day's Night. Uh, I wouldn't have guessed that they were supposed to be depicted as 14-year-old girls. Just, just saying. Okay? Mm -hmm. You said this was written by Jim Lee, right? And, and pencils. Yeah. He, he, he plotted it and he penciled it. Oh, he plotted. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Brandon Choi did the uh, script. Okay. And where, where is Johnny Storm being attacked by these four, uh, uh, totally uh, objectified, uh, objectified himself by these 14-year-old girls? He's in a toy store called Toy Biz. Uh, Thank you, 90s. Anyway, yeah. Toy Biz, if anybody knows, that that's the company that... Uh, so what was the deal? I know they put out the toys for Marvel, but isn't that, wasn't that an affiliate of Marvel's at the time? Or was something was going so, on? I think so, maybe. Well, they got product placement. Let's just put yeah, it that. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. no doubt. <laughs> and of course, before he can escape on his motorcycle, which he had ridden to the store, uh, he sees the, the four, the emergency flare in the sky. So he flames on and he flies off, leaving his bike behind. I don't, I don't know why he would leave his motorcycle behind, but he, he flames on and he flies off. Based on comments from citizens and a scene with the thing. Uh, oh, well, th these are my notes. I'm reading my notes. But I, I, I wasn't 100% sure this was part of the whole Heroes Reborn saga. Uh, but I was putting it all together based on it was issue number four, the Fantastic Four, the timing of it, plus comments from citizens and a scene with the thing where... He doesn't know Alicia Masters very well yet, like he's trying to find her because they met in a previous issue and he wants to ask her out on a date, but he's shy or something like that. And he thinks he sees her on the side of the road while he's in a car being driven by their lackey. I forgot what his name was. And uh, he's not used to his thing, rock-like body, so he can't open the door to the car. So he busts out of the car in a beautiful, it was a beautiful two-page two splash. Uh, again, penciled by Jim Lee, inked by Scott Williams. So it's a beautiful picture of the thing wrecking this car. And of course, it's not Alicia Masters that he thinks he sees on the street. But this woman, uh, whether she's starstruck or she thinks the thing is really, really hot, starts hitting on the thing and wants to give him her number. And okay. of course, he's embarrassed because it's not the woman he thought it was. <laughs> and of course, he just wrecked the car apparently not the first car he's wrecked since he's been the thing and he goes off and she uh she says well call me you know call me uh you know in today's climate of you, yeah, you know this, this, this sounds is, very weird <laughs> yeah but but it's so totally 90s they uh oh god <laughs> okay i'll tell you what i guess there is a holiday themed moment in here because while Johnny was at Toy Biz, he bought Fantastic Four themed action figures. Of course. And on the roof of the Baxter building, where uh, Sue is waiting for them, the Invisible Woman, I guess she was called the Invisible Woman in this version of the Fantastic Four, she is the one who set off the flare as a test because they are new to their powers here. This is that new Heroes Reborn world. So they, she's testing them out because they... They need to operate as a team as efficiently as possible. And she didn't like the time that it took both Ben and Johnny to get to the building. He explained that he was over at Toy Biz buying those licensed toys. And there are two of him. One in his regular blue costume 
and one in his new combat mode red costume that Sue comments on and says, why is your costume red? And he said, well, you got to wear a red costume so you can have an extra action figure. Oh my gosh. (laughs) But now back to our story. (laughs) Oh Oh my gosh. But that might be the only thing holiday themed here because there's a toy. Okay. He didn't say he was buying it for Franklin or I don't think Valeria existed back then, but it's not like he was buying them for kids or the toys for tots. He was buying them because he's an action figure collector. All right. As one does. As, as, as one might do. Right. <laughs> this George, this is like the anti-Christmas comic. <laughs> I'm telling you. And again, mind, mind you, the cover, a sexified, invisible girl on the cover, and the other guy's in the back, and you at least think you're going to see something Christmassy going on in here. Not a thing. Ugh. <laughs> All right. Now, an object emerged from a stellar anomaly while the four of them were embarked on the test flight that gave them their powers. This object, of course, has been tracked to have landed in the jungles of Wakanda. Hmm. And of course, Sue Storm knows T'Challa, or I guess I'll find out finally how to properly pronounce his name when they have the movie. Uh, because he has done work with the Storm Foundation, whatever that is in the Heroes Reborn world. So Sue knows King T'Challa from Wakanda. There's also a mystery man looking for Reed, culminating in a, a meeting between him, Johnny, and Ben, where there's a close-up of the thing's eyes, and he goes, Holy cow! You, but we never find out who that person is in issue number four. So it's one of those, you know, one of those devices everybody uses. It. Not quite sure who that person winds up being. I'm not going to seek this out. Trust me. Although <laughs> art is beautiful, like that two page spread I told you about the thing busting out of the car, and uh, something else we're going to get to really really soon. Uh, the the art's beautiful, but um, I'm not quite sure I could read through this. So again, I'm not quite sure you missed anything. Uh, Heroes reborn wise. Uh, again, this is supposed to be a holiday themed comic. Nothing holiday, right? Not a, not a thing. Not a thing. Uh, you know what? I'm just going to uh, skip through all these notes here. Basically, our heroes find the, uh, the area where whatever this object is has landed, but somebody has beat them to it. Who is it? An evil version of Wyatt Wingfoot. And he's, e- <laughs> no, he's evil because he's standing there smoking a cigarette, and he looks ominous. But he's not collecting this object for himself. He's collecting it for the boss. Well, of course, the Black Panther, Mr. Fantastic, and the Invisible Woman fall victim to a trap. And Wyatt Wingfoot decides, rather than leave them behind or outright kill them, let's bring them to the boss along with whatever the object is. And who is that boss? on a beautiful two-page spread that you have to turn the book sideways so you can see the full glory of the two-page spread. Spoiler, Dr. Doom. Of course. Which is probably his first appearance in this Heroes Reborn world. Okay. So what did we learn here, Eric? So we learned that you can't judge a book by its cover. (laughs) It's getting truer than that. And the 90s can really hornswoggle you, I think. (laughs) i'm going to end this on a fun note though i think i was paying attention to the ads there were a lot of video game ads at the time and they were 16 bit not 8 bit they were 16 bit so there was right there on the inside front cover war of the gems for your super nes which is basically the infinity war oh okay Yeah. yeah there was a hulk pantheon saga for PlayStation from a company called Eidos. I don't know how to pronounce that. Mm E-I-D-O-S. There was a... Oh, so first of all, did you play any of these games that I just mentioned? No, I... I, As I mentioned, I I couldn't buy a lot of comics when I was a kid, Mm -hmm. nor could I afford any video games. Yeah, and I I, (laughs) I wasn't really a big video game player myself. There, uh, There was another video game, NFL Game Day 97, with... 
beautiful 16-bit graphics mm-hmm. that any kid today would laugh at if they saw it. <laughs> that's retro now, George. That's that's probably that's in. Very retro. Well, actually, yeah, they, they might get into that. But anyway, that is my Christmas-themed comic, and I will send you pictures so you can post them on your site to show you how I easily I got fooled that Fantastic <laughs> Four, number four, volume two, was going to be a Christmas-themed comic. And mm-hmm. it was going to be a fun Christmas-themed comic. But no, 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 no. Now, I, I, your listeners are probably saying, all right, George, once you realized, I mean, it's not like you just read these books today. Right. <laughs> once you realized that this book had nothing to do with Christmas, why didn't you just get another comic to read? It's not like we don't have decades and decades worth of holiday comics. Plus, I just admitted I could have at least gone to last year's if I wanted to. Mm-hmm. I thought it would be funnier to just leave my original list intact. And just have everybody share my pain. That's really all it was. <laughs> you, just, you just want to share the pain. That's really all it was. Plus, I, well, I want people to see the cover of this book and, and tell me or, and tell you via the uh, feedback you may receive, would they have been fooled too? If this yeah. was on the newsstand in 97, I mean, unless they thumb through it, maybe. Uh, but uh, it's very easy to be fooled by this book that it, it was going to be Christmas themed. It came out in... December of that uh, 96, I guess. So, you know, that why wouldn't you think that there was going to be something holiday-ish in there? Even snow. Can we get some snow? Yeah. I'm in the jungles of Wakanda. There's no snow there. <laughs> Eric, what's your first book? <laughs> uh, well, actually, my first book has snow on the cover. Mm-hmm. And not only does it have snow, it has a Christmas wreath. Oh, see, that's what I wanted, man. And, and and the word Christmas actually appears on it. This is um, The New Adventures of Superboy number 39. Oh, nice. Sh- showing George on the video feed here so you he can see it. Gil Kane cover? That is a Gil Kane cover. Nice. Uh, this is... I've uh, never read that one. I can tell you right now, I've never read that one. I hadn't read it until I I pulled it out uh, uh, for this episode, George. I, I have a full a full collection of the New Adventures of Superboy. I I uh, had read the first I don't know dozen or fifteen issues mm-hmm. back when it was first published, mm-hmm. and uh, then I I dropped the title all those years ago, and then I got a a hankering to read some more New Adventures of Superboy, and uh, I bought I ended up getting the whole the whole lot of it, and this is one of the new ones that I hadn't read before. Hmm. Uh, this was published. Uh, I did. I did actual. Well, uh, according to uh, I think comic book. D- no, uh, Mike's Amazing World of Comics. That's that's where I got this information. But I got the uh, on sale date instead of the cover date. Mm. Uh, this was published on or around December thirtieth, nineteen eighty two. Oh, okay. Uh, the story is entitled or titled "A World Without Christmas." This is by Paul Kupperberg, Kurt Schaffenberger. Ben Oda and Jerry Serp, Serpy, Serpe, uh, and and as, as you noted, uh, the cover by by Gil Kane. So, uh, okay, now I've got to know. You're gonna you're gonna say the same thing that happened to me, right? You got bamboozled, and it had nothing to do with Christmas, even though they put it in the title, right? <laughs> uh, well, you know, along the way, I'm thinking, what what is this story really about? It's mm-hmm. it's a weird thing. It's it's kind of a mashup of It's a Wonderful Life with a bit of a Charlie Brown Christmas thrown in, too. Oh, cool. Uh, well, one thing I want to ask before you get into it, and one thing okay. I forgot to mention about my comic, which I want to, want to talk about for all our comics, this uh, one from 97 had a cover price of 195 What's the cover price on yours? You said 82 60 cents. 82 you said, right? Yeah, from 1982, yeah. Okay. Folks, let's keep an eye on the years. And the prices. Yeah. Okay. okay. Good mm-hmm. Good point. Uh, yeah. So like I said, uh, uh, it's a wonderful life with Charlie Brown, Christmas thrown in. So uh, uh, fellow small villain, Bash Baff- Bashford. Uh, who, who am I? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not too familiar with Superboy lore. Is, is that a very is that a well known Superboy character, Bash Bashford? I I I I'm gonna guess. Uh, I remember the character. Or I remember uh, uh, encountering the character. I think in the in those first issues that I read. Okay. Um. But I, honestly, when I read through this this issue this particular issue, I I couldn't tell you. You know, when I first when I first opened the page and saw this character there, I couldn't tell you who it was. 
Mm-hmm. So I, I'm kind of suspecting maybe that it was a character made for this particular run of comics. Mm. Uh, but, but he is, he's, he goes to Smallville High. He kind of, I think I got the sense that he kind of picks on Clark Kent mm-hmm. a little bit, but he is actually visiting the Kent home at, uh, it's Christmas Eve, uh, because his parents are away. They're traveling somewhere for something. And so Bash is a little down. On Christmas, he complains about the commercialism. That's where I get the Charlie Brown Christmas part, uh. in it, right? And he's talking, he's complaining about the plastic this and that of of of, of Christmas. Uh, in fact, he says, "When I was a kid, <laughs> stop <laughs> stop me if you've heard this, George, or some variation of this. When I was a kid, it was different. Christmas meant something." <laughs> If he tells Mom Pa Kent to get off his lawn, I don't know where this is going to go. <laughs> well, he does. Uh, Lana Lang is over as well, and uh, she's trying to cheer him up, and 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 uh, stands below the uh, the uh, the mistletoe and and makes some sort of coy comment about, "Well, look where I'm standing, Bash." You know, just trying to lighten the mood, and yeah. and he angrily grabs the plastic mistletoe from from the ceiling and breaks it in two in front of her and <laughs> it's just like what this this kid is way too cynical and a, a tad violent mm-hmm. for being a high schooler uh in smallville so uh he he runs off he wants to be alone and clark you know good 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 old clark kent he just he tells his folks and lana that he's going to go out there and try and talk to bash and 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 uh, calm him down and stuff uh, but instead, he turn he he changes into Superboy and flies off to to find Bash and says, uh, "Hey, I was on patrol and I saw you out here, Bash. What, what's going on?" <laughs> you know, as as Superboy does. Uh-huh. And and so he, when Bash is is telling Superboy his, again his complaints about Christmas, Superboy gets the brilliant idea of taking uh, Bash somewhere where Christmas does not exist so that hmm. he could learn the value of Christmas. I see. And so Superboy kidnaps, I mean, <laughs> takes Bash <laughs> to an alt- a parallel earth. To Bedford Falls? <laughs> well, that's see, that's where I thought we were going with this, with yeah. some sort of version of it's, it's a Wonderful Life. And it is, It's but it's kind of like the dark mirror image of, of It's a Wonderful... Well, not really. It actually is like that. Hmm. Now that I think about it, because things... Uh, they arrive on this earth, whatever earth it is. I don't, it doesn't, doesn't give a number, uh-huh. um, but, but Superboy does uh, reference his recent journey and visit to earth two. Oh. Uh, and, and I think uh, the previous uh, 30 issues or something like that. So I, I'm looking mm-hmm. forward to reading that. Okay, find, cool. Finding out about that. So, but there's no, there's no like footnote or, or, you know, just. Just a plain old editor's uh, 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 caption box saying, "This is Earth, blah blah blah, whatever it is." It's right. just they go to this, goes to this other Earth. Oh, oh, that's the other thing. Because Superboy has gone to has has visited Earth two. Um, apparently, he's been just going off into the multiverse, exploring all these places. He had to have because how else would he have known that this this particular Earth existed without a Christmas, right? I see. It, it, was that was that a theme of that series that he was traveling all over the place, or you that don't know? The first I'd I'd ever heard of it. So okay, I wonder if it, if uh, I'm not. I am really curious now if the the Earth Two visit and this are the only times he ever goes to a to a parallel right. Earth. I'll be reading the entire series, wanting him to go to parallel Earths, and he's not going to do it. <laughs> so you know, I'm just wondering. So he so what? Superboy has time to just fly around cataloging all these parallel Earths. Until he finds one like this. That's why his grades are down. <laughs> that's why Lex Luthor's still on the loose. That's why Lex Luthor is smarter than him. <laughs> that's, right, that's true. Very true. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So, he, he takes Bash there. Uh, they encounter the locals. They encounter that Earth's version of Clark Kent. Mm. And ba- Bash makes a comment about how this, how Clark Kent is, is, is a wimp on this Earth, too. <laughs> or I should say this earth as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and along the way, uh, they get separated. Mm. And as Superboy is trying to find him, Superboy encounters Pa Kent mm. and essentially finds out that uh, uh, th- this world that they live in, uh, greed and hatred have taken their toll. This is Pa Kent telling him this. Violence is the only thing people understand now. 
And I thought, when I first read that, George, I'm thinking, hmm, <laughs> this sounds way too uncomfortably familiar to mm-hmm. me. Yep. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure people uh, back in 82 were thinking the same thing. But, you know, it's, yeah. just, it's just really funny how, how things... 35 years later, not much has changed. I not guess. much has changed, right? And so, even that comic from 97 with how people are dressed and uh, depicted. Yeah, not much has changed. <laughs> we, th- yeah. we think it's bad, but it's always been this way. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. It's a shame, yeah. The more things change, the more they stay mm-hmm. the same. So, yeah, and there's there's even this weird offhand comment from one of the characters who actually attacked Superboy and Bash at the beginning of the story because they're they're outsiders, right? And so it's it's like, you know, every man for him him or herself, every man or woman for him or herself. Uh and, you know, it's just like a it's literally a dog eat dog world. And oh. uh, you know, so you know, they they get away, like I said, but there there's this offhand comment made about uh a war that that was never resolved in the story. And even, you know, so they the, the character makes this comment, Superboy's like what war is this? And I'm thinking, wait a minute, you've been here before, Superboy. What is the deal? <laughs> but apparently it was just a uh, a quick, uh, hey, 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 New Earth, I'm Superboy. And then he left. I don't know. Maybe. Right, yeah. But um, anyway, so there's no, there's apparently no police. It's mob rule on this world. Um. Oh, uh, about the war thing. Uh, uh, it, it's interesting because Bash actually makes a reference to Vietnam earlier in the story before they go to this this other Earth. Uh, so that tells you approximately when the New Adventures of Superboy was set at at that time, anyway. Right. But anyway, so um, uh, despite the fact that there's no police and it's mob rule, certain people of the society preach peace and brotherhood, and. Uh, the group in Smallville is led by a certain person. The, the person is so they the pollution is so bad on this Earth, George, that they have to wear gas masks, mm. which is a, a huge plot contrivance for what comes up here. Uh-huh. Um, so uh, uh, Superboy ends up finding Bash. Uh, it was it was uh, this other person, the the leader who who brought him uh, inside one of the buildings to protect him from the mob. And in in payment, in return for them helping him, Bash decides to teach them a Christmas carol. Mm. So Superboy hears the singing, and he's like, "Wait a minute! There's no Christmas here. What's going on?" So he goes in the room, and Bash is he Bash is just saying, "Hey, because because they helped me, I decided to repay them like this." There there was no you know speaking strictly from a storytelling standpoint, George. Mm-hmm. There was no character turn whatsoever. It's just like literally, he's there. There's no Christmas. He's saved. There's Christmas in, in yeah. Bash's heart, you know? So it's just, right. <laughs> there's a lot they had to do in these 15 or so pages. I understand yes. that, but mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then, and then here's, here's the two toppers, uh, with it. Um, because Superboy helped them with, with this mob and everything and kept them safe because they, they, they were actually found by, by the mob and they were all going to be attacked and, and presumably killed. Mm-hmm. Um, Superboy uh, uh, dug a a hole underneath the building and brought them all down to protect them because they didn't want they didn't want Superboy you know because they're they're all about peace they didn't want Superboy to fight fight the group okay which you know admirable yeah um but because Superboy helped them on this particular day George can you guess <laughs> what day this is on this parallel world. Ah, July 12th. <laughs> <laughs> Good guess. Good guess. <laughs> December 25th. December 25th. Mm-hmm. And then we also find out that uh, the person, the leader of this this uh, the peace and brotherhood group in Smallville is none other than that world's Bash Bashford. Mm-hmm. And thus, the world is safe again. And an angel... Got his wings. <laughs> and when Superboy got good old Bash Bashford back to Smallville, we find out his grandfather is none other than Mr. Potter. <laughs> oh. <laughs> now, I, you, you, I would have enjoyed that story. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, held up a copy of the cover, the Gil Kane cover. Can you describe to everybody what was going on on that cover? 
Yeah, so Superboy is flying overhead and he's being um, attacked with snowballs. Uh huh. People are throwing literally throwing snowballs at him. And snowballs, right? Those are the two weaknesses. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. You know, and he's he just wants to put the Christmas wreath somewhere, George. That's That's all. all. And and he he's what is he getting in payment? Snowballs in the face. That's right. Well, at least he had Christmas in his comic. That's all I have to say. Now, I, a lot, a lot of it too. Yeah. yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. A lot of DC comics of the time had backups. Uh, did that have a backup or no? Good, good, good eye there, George, or or good good supposition. Yes, there was a a new Dial H for Hero adventure in here. Oh, really? Dial which H. I actually did not read. Okay, no, no problem. Interesting uh, to see the pairing that they would do back then. Yeah. I, I, I doubt it's Christmas theme, though. Mm-hmm. It doesn't look like it as I flip through it. Mm-hmm. But but uh, since we're on the, <laughs> the subject, um, the two characters that the uh, the Dial H for Hero folks turn into. Okay, are? Um, rock and roll. <laughs> and I'll show George on the the video feed here. That's rock and roll, George. You're going to have to put a picture of that uh, along with the episode. Uh, Who who drew that? I'm trying. It looks like familiar drawing. I mean, is it like a Kurt Swan type of thing or who who did that? Uh, It says Bender. Oh, okay. They're they're, they're only doing last names here. So I'm not familiar with that. that It's Bender and Giella as far as pencils and inks. Okay. Hmm. That sounded like a fun one. Yeah, it was. It was interesting to go through. That's for sure. I was going to call an audible here with my second one and kind of flip-flop my two that I have remaining, the two main ones that I'm going to discuss. But I think I'm going to stick with my original order, if, if, that, if that's okay with you. Of course. Mm-hmm. So what, what is your number two? My number two is an issue of Brave and the Bold, volume one, number 184. Mm-hmm. Had a cover date of March 1982, so I guess it was out around the holidays of 81. Uh, that one... Had a cover price. I've got it right here. Had a cover price of sixty cents, also because it came out right around the time of your Superboy issue. It was written by Mike W. Barr, with art and cover art by Jim Aparo, one of my favorite Batman artists. Mm-hmm. Yes. And the colorist was Adrian Roy. And uh, I don't know if I uh, said this already, but it is Batman and the Huntress. I used to love team up books. I think you and I have talked about this on your show and on my show that uh, the Marvel team up books, the DC team up books were among my favorites. They came out at the right time in my comic reading career. And sadly in 16 short months, this series would end at number 200. Just Ah. like, just like another great series, (laughs) which might happen to be a podcast, but is that a coincidence? I think not. So unlike the Fantastic Four issue that, again, hornswoggled me, that had a title of In the Heart of Darkness, this issue's title is The Batman's Last Christmas. So I figured it was pretty safe that this would be a Christmas-themed issue, and it was. It was. And this is one that I found when I was digging around in my boxes. It was a random find. It, it was in no order. It, it was by itself. It wasn't with my other Brave and the Bold. So I got pretty lucky that, that, that I found it. Luck or fate, George? There you go, Eric. There you go. Uh, on the cover, there is a uh, snow-covered uh, ground. Batman is in front of the grave sites of his parents. He is taking off his cape and cowl. And he is yelling, my parents deserve to die. And the Batman must die as well. And the Huntress is watching from behind another gravestone behind him in horror. Dun, dun, dun. All right. As anybody who read comics in this time knows, Batman was depicted a lot differently pre-crisis than he is depicted now. So some of the things here might sound a little odd to some of you. Some of them might be refreshing nostalgia. Mm -hmm. Oh, and by the way, the... uh, the logos for the heroes on these team-up books, I must say that the Batman logo on this book in particular is one of my favorite Batman logos. So yeah. not only is Jim Apparel one of my favorite Batman artists, but that logo that they had on here. And again, Eric, I'll provide you pictures of all these things so you can post them if you'd like. 
almost in parallel to what you said about Earth 2. The Huntress from Earth 2 comes to visit Batman on Earth 1 for the holidays. Oh, and I, I guess I should say that the opening page of this issue, unlike the one in the Fantastic Four, where an atrocity occurred in the Wakandan jungle, this one has Batman making a special Christmas deliver, de- delivery anonymously at an orphanage. So again, you know you're, you're at Christmas time, right, right here. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, so uh, the Huntress comes from uh, Earth 2 to Earth 1 for the holidays. She came to see Uncle Bruce. Yes. Uncle, uh, I, I I love that she did that back then. Mm-hmm. That you know this this guy who, to her, is her dad, but it's not mm-hmm. her dad, right? And so yeah, Uncle Bruce, I love I I always love that. I'm going to make the assumption that unlike my show, your listeners know what we're talking about with Earth One, Earth Two, and I'm not going to go into any of that because they're probably <laughs> more well versed in that than I am. Anyway, uh, my show, I had to I would have to at least give some sort of cursory explanation as to what was going on. I know I don't have to do that here. And if anybody does have a question, they can always ask you because you're the authority and I am not. (laughs) But let me tell you something, Eric. There was something quaint and of its time in the multiple Earths concept from those pre-crisis days that I miss today. I I really do. I mean, I I love all these crossovers and stuff. Uh, I'm not reading metal uh, because Peter Rios is reading it for me and he's breaking it down and I don't have to (laughs) to have to read it. Uh, I am right. I am reading the Doomsday Clock, but I'm not I'm not reading now. Uh, but the fact that Helena now Helena is the right way to pronounce that, right? Her That's name. That's how I pronounce okay. it. Yeah. Uh, just the well, fact that. She, al- although George, I, I I actually work with a woman or worked with a woman who spelled her name the same way, but uh, she pronounced it Helena. Really? So so I don't know. Okay. Well, I think mostly I'm going to call her the Huntress here, but <laughs> just just for everybody's uh, sanity. But the fact that she comes from Earth 2 doesn't seem to phase Bruce at all, because with the way they meet in the middle, he's he's in the middle of dealing with a thug, and she just happens to show up in her Huntress costume. It, it doesn't shock him at all. So this whole thing that the two Earths, Earths are really more like different counties in the same state, and somebody can just come over... <laughs> Over the, over the line, it, it, it just doesn't seem to phase them. And that, th- that's another thing that I like about the whole concept. I also realized how much I miss thought balloons. Especially, oh, right. Yeah, well, and especially, you know, in a comic where somebody's trying to solve a mystery, there's something about seeing the thought balloon rather than having the caption. I don't know why. It's, it, mm-hmm. The same words could be in a thought balloon as in a caption, but for some reason, I prefer the thought balloon. So that's I an age too. thing. That's a generational thing, I think. Yeah, yeah. So I miss those things. Batman has to retrieve some stolen financial documents regarding mob activity from, you guessed it, a thug dressed as Santa Claus. <laughs> of course. Of course, with the papers in his satchel of goodies. Now, they couldn't have thrown a Santa Claus in that darn Fantastic Four issue <laughs> all those years later, but I digress. The thug, this is what I love again, the thought balloons. He thinks like he speaks. Merry Christmas, Batman. You're last. And you're is spelled Y-E-R in his thought mm-hmm. balloon, right? Mm-hmm. So that, that's that's another thing I love. <laughs> uh, of course, he quickly dispatches of this thug, and he sees evidence in the paperwork that his father, Thomas Wayne, loaned money to Spurs Sanders so he could become a mob boss. Could this be true? Dun, dun, dun. Tune in next week. Same bad time. <laughs> same bad channel. He seemingly confirms this evidence, and he decides he would be a hypocrite if he continued finding crime as Batman in his father's name and to avenge his and his mother's murder. So, of course, what does he do, Eric? He gives up the mantle of the Batman in dramatic fashion by removing his cane and cowl, as he did on the cover, in front of the grave sites of his parents. Yeah. Well, at least, it, at least the cover is representative of the contents, George. <laughs> and, you, you know, I'd like to say I do miss that part of comics, that a panel essentially is recreated as as the cover is a larger image with maybe more detail. Uh, but I guess I'm, I might be a little 50-50 on that, but I, I, I think that's quaint. Mm-hmm. And I guess I think that's quaint because I was a kid when I was reading stuff like this. So I, I guess that's why I feel that way, as opposed to having everybody dressed in Christmas outfits on the cover of your book and not have anything to do with Christmas on the inside of the book. 
Thank you, Marvel in the 90s. Anyway, <laughs> the Huntress sees this as a parallel to her own father, like you described, Eric, because uh, the Batman of Earth 2 gave up the mantle when her mother, Catwoman, died. I, I, we're not giving out spoilers here to concepts that are 30 years old. I'm not afraid of that right now. And no longer in continuity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Now, she's haunted by the fact that events may repeat themselves on these two Earths. I guess that's a known fact. You know, now that all these people are going back and forth on all these Earths, one of the things she's worried about is, could the same thing that happened on my Earth happen here just in a different way? Mm -hmm. Right? As luck would have it, everything, uh, you know, it's, it's a one issue, one and done, like they were back in those days. Everything gets nicely resolved. I'm not going to go into the details of it. And But when does it get resolved, Eric? Like you asked me the date that your your story was resolved. This one is resolved on December 24th, mm -hmm. Christmas Eve. And as the mystery is solved, Thomas Wayne's integrity is intact. And Bruce rededicates his life to fighting crime as Batman. Until the next time he finds out something bad about his parents. Right. He does yeah. it again. <laughs> now, here's again, here are the things that I love about going back to these old comics like this. A, the holidays. B, instead of everyone in the shared universe having attitude and being treated like more like antiheroes, these characters are actually nice and respectful to each other. And especially in today's day and age, I find that very refreshing. I, it was something we took for granted back then. And now to see it, even if even having to reread something from 30 years ago to see it, uh, I find it to be a refreshing jolt compared to the characterizations of some of our favorite characters that we've known all these years. I, I like to go back to that. Now, some people say uh, the writing was simplistic. The characterization was simplistic. I mean, what really happened in that book? I'll tell you what happened in that book. Characters that we knew were involved in an adventure. It happened to wrap up in one issue, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. Not not every story has to have a great impact on a character's life. It could just be a tale of there's a problem. Let's solve it. It gets solved. We move on. Somebody doesn't have to die. A universe doesn't have to be destroyed. A new villain doesn't have to come out of it because of some sort of a loss. We don't need that every time we read a comic book. Sometimes we just need a fun story. And now you can get off my lawn. Much like your comic, this comic had a backup, and the backup was Nemesis. Are you familiar with Nemesis? Oh, I am, yeah. Okay, this seemed like it was the maybe last chapter of uh, however many parts story, because we were definitely in the middle of a, of a battle sequence. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not that familiar with Nemesis. Uh, looked like he was a little MacGyver-like in, in the way he, he did things. He, he was able to take things that... You, you you didn't think could get him out of a situation and it got him out of that situation. Mm, yeah, that's true. Good mm -hmm. point. But anyway, I was really unfamiliar with the character, but uh, I, I read the, read the, the story and, uh, you know, it was fun and wrapped up whatever story that they were telling uh, about nemesis. May I tell you about some of the ads in the book since it was holiday time? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Oh, and another thing that I miss about uh, comics from that age. So this is not only a holiday-themed episode, but it's a nostalgia episode. Well, it's perfect for Christmas. Yeah, you know something? That's right. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm sitting by the tree. The fire's going. I've got some cocoa. The Yule log is happening. <laughs> Eric, do you do you miss continued on second page following captions like I do? I kind of do, yeah. <laughs> I also miss page numbers on the page. Yes, it, it was refreshing to see that, too. Okay, so here are some of the ads. Again, it was the holidays. Uh, model cars were heavily advertised in this issue, just like video games were heavily advertised in that Fantastic Four issue I told you about. Mm -hmm. There was a Bubble Yum ad with Jack Davis art. And uh, I remember Jack Davis art in those Bubble Yum ads. And I knew who Jack Davis was thanks to Mad Magazine back then. Ah, uh, okay. Oh, and in the ad, there was a maze. And there was an entry for great prizes, including a Panasonic Reggie Vision with VCR and sound camera. Yeah. That was a grand prize. Okay, now we have ads for Heroes World Discount Comic and Book Club. And what they had for sale, they had Marvel Fanfare number one. It was solicited as a 32-page goodie on 
slick paper published bi-monthly. The first four issues feature Spider-Man and the X-Men team-up. $1.50 each. Ooh, what a bargain. Then you had that Hulk and Batman Treasury Edition, $2.50. Oh, man, if they could put something together that was that good back then for $2.50. Then Marvel Graphic Novel, number one, was coming out at the time, The Death of Captain Marvel, $5.95. They advertised action figures. Here you go, Eric, here for your Christmas uh, list back then. Chips. John, Ponch, the Sarge, and Superfoe, or the Dukes of Hazard, Bo, Luke, Daisy, Boss Hogg, and Chef Sheriff Roscoe P. Coltrane. <laughs> and of course, the first pyramid scheme for kids, Grit. Grit, yeah. <laughs> grit helps you start your own business. There's one other ad in here that I, I've got to talk about real quick, and I know I'm monopolizing this, and I apologize. I took so many notes, I never take this many notes on these books. There was, a, there was a Hostess Twinkies ad in here. And the Hostess Twinkies ad was an Aquaman-related one. Eric, when I saw this ad, not only did I smile, but I got this feeling in the pit of my stomach, and I'm going to tell you why. I had the opportunity to buy that original artwork for that ad. Really? Mm-hmm. But it was out of, out of my—I was working at the time. This is before I got laid off. It would. It was a. It was an auction, but it had the opportunity for a buy now, and the buy now price was. I'm thinking of four hundred dollars. I don't mind saying mm-hmm. the price. That was too steep for my blood, but I considered it, and I sat there with my finger over the, the <laughs> enter button, so long. And again, this was a time when I, I hadn't gotten laid off yet. Uh, financial things that happened to me since then didn't happen. But I still couldn't justify four hundred dollars for a page of art, even though a hostess. I know what you and I both know, and everybody listening knows that that original artwork is rare because there are only so many hostess ads, whether they're DC or Marvel right. characters. Right. To this day, that is one of those regrets that I have. And in fact, on our two hundredth episode, Greg Shegel asked if we had any regrets. I wish I had thought of that, even though it's not show related. Mm. That is one of my mm. stupid regrets in life. I mean, how stupid to even think of it all this time later. But I saw that ad. I opened my eyes wide. I'm like, oh, my God, I had an opportunity to have that original artwork. That's incredible. Oh, man. I, you know, until you until you just mentioned that, I'm like, well, I never even thought that that there would be original art pages of those ads. Yes, I, there I, are. I don't know why, mm-hmm. but it's obvious. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a comic page selling Twinkies or whatever. Right. So. Mm-hmm. And I that's... happened, I wasn't seeking it out. I, I, well, I was, I was at an auction site, but I was just kind of thumbing through stuff. I was more, I don't know how I got to a page where it was out of my price range so much, but I guess, you know, all these pages just pop up and I saw it and I was like, Oh my God, when, when else are you going to have this opportunity? But, you also have to have four hundred dollars at spare cash, which you know I didn't have at the time. So yeah, that was one of those could have, should have, and it probably would have been sitting in a portfolio anyway, not on a wall where it would have deserved to have been. Uh, but to have said that I had it, you, you know, for people like us and your listeners, it's like a sense of pride knowing that you own that. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, all these years later, it's a stupid regret that I have. And when I <laughs> saw it, it just brought it all back, and I got that feeling in my stomach, like. Oh, I remember what it felt like. Like, should I? Shouldn't I? You, you shouldn't. Don't be an idiot. Don't do it. Yeah, man. Good times, Eric. Good times. So, George, I have this issue as well. Um, in fact, I have a couple copies of this issue because my original copy had a, a torn cover. And wait, and the one only... the one that I just talked about? Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, I, I was just glancing on my notes. I, I know I keep interrupting you, but I got to tell you this one other thing, man. One okay. other thing. Hold that thought. I've got to compare Bruce Wayne to Ralphie in a Christmas story when he's online for Santa Claus and the kid in the aviator goggles tries to talk to him uh-huh. and, and he says, shut up. I'm thinking, you know, I, he doesn't want to talk to the kid. He's got to think about what he's going to say to Santa. So he says, I'm thinking, well, Batman pulls the same stunt on the Huntress. <laughs> they get back from, I don't know trying to put a heavy hand on the mobster or whatever they were trying to do. They're back at Wayne Manor in front of the Christmas tree out of costume. And Helena's trying to talk to Bruce and he goes, 
hush, Helena, I need to concentrate. And then he starts remembering something from his past when he was a kid in front of the Christmas tree. But right. his scolding of her, A, is inappropriate, and B, reminded me of Ralphie in that particular case. So yeah, I, I just yeah. had to bring that up, man. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. You go on. It's your show. I'm sorry. Uh, 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 what was I saying? Oh, um, had multiple copies of uh, that Brave and the Bold number 184. Right. So, so I, th- this copy that I, that I have pulled out and, and, uh, have been looking at as you've been talking. Oh, you were following? Um, I was, yes. <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, I, I, I've only gotten in probably the last couple of years, but, mm-hmm. uh, I just want to point out, uh, one thing that, uh, I thought was really cool at the very end of the story, George. Mm-hmm. Um, there's this, this, this roll of, uh, of paper drawn on the page with, with the, these baby cherubs, uh, below a candle and whatnot, but, it, but it has all these signatures that says Merry Christmas from the DC staff and mm-hmm. it has all this, you know, Jeanette Kahn, Dick Giordano, Paul Levitz, Karen Berger, you know, all the way down, uh, Lynn Ween's on here. It just, you know, just, it's just really cool to see. The you know the the people who behind uh, the comics that we love, right? Um, and and I remember seeing this uh, before. I, I think they I think it was something they did, maybe not every year, but but occasionally. Mm. Or maybe I'm just thinking of this particular issue because this this issue of Batman and and Huntress and Brave and the Bold. Um, for some reason, I I I really like this issue, mm-hmm. and, and I, I, whenever I think about Christmas comics, this is actually one of the first ones I think of. Really. Just, you know, because it's it, for some reason it, it has resonated with me through all these years. Interesting. Wow. So, yeah, I like that one. I like that a lot. Like you said, Jim Aparo Batman is just, it's lovely. Yeah, there's something about it. I don't know. Again, maybe it's nostalgia. I mean, Neil Adams was also drawing Batman a little earlier and approximately at the same time. More realistic, that's mm-hmm. for sure. I mean, if you were to compare the two styles, but. There is something, maybe I was just reading more titles drawn by Jim Aparo. So that was my Batman. Just like yeah, if you if you happen to discover Doctor Who in this incarnation, your doctor is the ninth or the tenth, whereas people who have known Doctor Who forever, their doctor is the third or the fourth, that kind of thing. It's all a matter when you discover something, I guess. Yeah. 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 Well, um, speaking of Batman, mm-hmm. my next Christmas comic uh, comes from... Batman Family uh, number four. So we get an, 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 another number four issue, George. Oh, that's sweet. So this is uh, this was published in on December fifth, nineteen seventy five. Ooh, what's the cover price on that? That is a fifty cent cover price, but it is it's got um, well, it says giant DC. It's it's one of those DC giants. So I imagine it's like a hundred pages or something. Am I, am I the only one who loved books like that? Because it those were all kind of one and done, weren't they? If I recall correctly. Well, I think uh, m- uh, perhaps uh, I'm I'm not entirely sure because uh-huh. while I do have a certain amount of these Batman families, and I'll explain why in a minute. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't read a whole lot of them. Oh, okay. And in fact, in fact, I I did not read this particular issue until again for this episode. <laughs> so <laughs> these are all. Uh, these are actually all, well, except for the last one, these are all new to me. No, wait, no, the last one is too. I didn't read that one either until, until, uh, just the other day. So, right. I, I I just remember, I think because they were giant and double sized and because they were thick and they had that logo giant, you know, special. And at the time, still relatively inexpensive. You could have two quarters on you and pick them up as a kid at the local Seven Eleven. I think I bought a lot of those when they were on the stand. And uh, those I have fond memories of, those uh, super specials, even on the Marvel side, too. You know, king size issues of certain books. Those were always a lot of fun to read. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, like I said, I I, I got uh, several of these and I did or I started getting them because there's a lot of solo robin stories in them oh i see Uh and and so the the uh the the story that i chose out of this dc giant batman family has to do with robin Mm -hmm. and this is it's called this is such a weird title george it's called robin's white very in kind of 
quotes or parentheses. Uh, I remember. I have to look it up now. Okay. Christmas. So okay. Robin's white, very Christmas. Instead of Robin's very white Christmas. Yeah, it, right. literally. That's that. That's what it says. And in fact, <laughs> let me let me just go to it real quick here. Make sure. No, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it is. It's it says so in 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 blue text. It says at the bottom of this page, Robin's white Christmas. Okay. But then. Using proofreader's marks to indicate an insert between the words, it has the word above very in parentheses. I so see. Robin's white, very Christmas. <laughs> it's so that is I, I as as a word person, as someone who works professionally as an editor, mm-hmm. um <laughs> That wouldn't have gotten by you. That, that really bugs me. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, at least they got the correct uh, proofreader's mark to you know for an insert. I'll I'll give them that. But uh but this this story involves uh uh well it opens up with Dick Grayson and his girlfriend Lori. This, so this is this is uh um the time when Dick is attending Hudson University. Mm-hmm. Uh when he's you know first going off on his own. He hasn't him and Batman haven't, you know, broken up I don't think at this point. You know, they haven't end, they haven't uh dissolved their partnership, mm-hmm. but he's he's off on his own doing 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 the university thing. And and uh, I know this character, his girlfriend Lori. I, I've heard of her. I've not read a whole lot about her, or or a whole lot of comics with her in it. Um, so it was it was it was kind of neat to to visit this this uh, story um, with her in it because I like I just don't know a, a whole lot about her other than Dick na- dated this girl in in college called Lori. And so, uh, like I said, the story opens with uh, Dick's kind of down in the dumps because. There's an there's a snowstorm coming and uh, he he's afraid that that, that the the snow may cause him to miss the plane the plane ride back to Gotham City because he's going to go go home and and spend the holidays with Bruce and Alfred and Uncle Uncle oh my gosh Aunt Harriet so this was at the point where Aunt Harriet was actually in the comics wow and you know this is 1975 this is you know well after the Batman TV series yes. Huh. So uh, I thought that was interesting that she was still still around. I got to admit, I never realized Anne Harriet made it into the Bat books, into the yeah. comics. Oh, yeah. Which yeah. came I, first, though? Wasn't the TV show was first, or? Oh, now that you say that, I I'm not sure. I thought I thought she was she brought was into the there. TV show and then the... they brought her in the comics, but maybe it was the other way around. Well, I'm thinking I'm thinking the first way you just said it that the, they created her for the TV show and kind of like what they're doing today to make the comics reflect. Mm-hmm. The other media rather than the other way around mm-hmm. they might have brought her in the books because now people had seen her on tv and they were watching her reruns maybe i don't yeah, yeah that's a good question I, I'm, I'm sure somebody out there knows the answer to this off the top of their heads and they can let us know but <laughs> of course we'll find out when peter uh your your legion project co-host peter rios and his own co-host adam murdo do their crisis tapes for issue number seven of Crisis on Infinite Earths, where Aunt Harriet meets an untimely demise as she tries to <laughs> save her sex. She's yeah, she's one of the background characters where mm-hmm. the, the, the wall of antimatter comes through. And the funny thing is, I was talking to Murd and, and Peter because you know I talk to them all the time, and they did say they were going to devote an entire Crisis episode to Aunt Harriet. So everybody, be on the lookout. <laughs> Hmm. Mm. I, I didn't, I'm not sure about that one, George, but I guess I, it, we'll find out. I, you know what? We may have inadvertently figured out the ending of Batman Metal. <laughs> I will pay <Bad>. you <laughs> something if that ends up to being, being the case. The big bad even, is Anne Harriet. <laughs> even remotely true. The Batman who laughs is really Anne Harriet. Oh my gosh. Oh boy. That would be that would be so funny. <laughs> Somebody get on that. <laughs> yeah. But before all that, mm-hmm. um back to the comic. That's the uh, Aunt Harriet derailment. <laughs> See, if this were my show, that would be the title of the show now. The Aunt Harriet derailment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like I said, they're 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 uh they're driving along somewhere, I guess, and like and like I said, Dick is lamenting the fact that he might miss his plane ride. Uh, and then they encounter this hitchhiking Santa, hmm. who turns out to be uh, the Hudson University security chief, who apparently is a reoccurring character. Okay, named Bash uh, Bashford. <laughs> um, 
uh, no, but his name is McDonald. Oh. Chief McDonald. Oh, Chief McDonald. Yes. So, uh, but it turns out he, he needs a lift, uh, because, and the reason he's dressed up as Santa is because he's helping the Hudson University sidewalk Santas, uh, go out into the community and collect money to buy gifts for the needy and the homeless in the area. Mm-hmm. So Dick and Lori, despite the fact that Dick is concerned about catching this plane, decides to help them out. You know, that's, that's a good thing, a good neighborly. Sure. Christmas time thing to do, um, to, to, uh, um, volunteer time for, for a needy cause, for a good cause. Sure. Um, and so, uh, they've, they've collected a certain amount of money and, and, uh, they're about ready to head back to the, the, uh, sidewalk Santa's HQ when Chief McDonald and Lori, uh, bop in to get some coffee to heat themselves up because they've been out in the snow sure. and someone, uh, knocks Dick down from behind and takes off with the sleigh that they had where they, they've been going around collecting this money. And so he decides, Dick decides, of course, that he, because he got the, the drop was made on him, that Robin has to investigate and, and help recover the money. Um, uh, so Robin shows up and Dick is gone because he got hit from behind as Robin explains to Lori mm-hmm. standing in front of him. Uh, that he's, he's put, uh, put Dick away to rest and recuperate. Doesn't say where, <laughs> of course. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, uh, and then I thought this was really kind of neat, George. Uh, Security Chief McDonald asks about the inappropriate for winter costume that Robin wears. Mm-hmm. And then Robin makes this quip about, he could say something about wearing bat thermal underwear, which I thought was, <laughs> that has to be a callback to the Batman TV show. Cause right. I remember a, an episode specifically. Where they're they're getting prepared for an altercation with Mister Freeze, and um, and uh, later in the episode, Batman is is not phased by Mister Freeze because he's wearing bat thermal underwear. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I, I used to get that every Christmas from my grandmother. You had a great grandmother. <laughs> I can tell you, P- pajamas and bat thermal underwear. Yeah. So, so then Robin, of course, you know, being the protege of the Batman, mm-hmm. quickly deduces that the thief will be going back to the student center, which is the, where they have, they're all, um, uh, congregating with their, their, uh, contributions from, from the community. And, uh, uh, so he goes there, confronts the thief and his two, two helpers, uh, who pull out guns, you know, cause they're gonna, they're gonna steal all the dough. And then they get into this like two or three page fight between Robin and these robbers. Um, with Robin throwing punny lines left and right, you know, cause he's still in that stage where, you know, Robin's got to make the jokes. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, he takes care of them. And afterwards, so then, uh, you know, fi- you know, Dick, uh, Robin leaves, Dick comes back and, and instead of, you know, Lori showing any kind of concern about what happened with him or Dick explaining anything because we're running out of pages here. <laughs> All Dick does is again, complain about the fact that he will miss Christmas with Bruce uh, in Gotham because of the weather. So Lori very nicely, I thought invites her boyfriend to spend Christmas with her family there, uh, wherever Hudson university is. And, uh, so Dick is like, okay, mm-hmm. <laughs> Dick seems very excited about this possibility. I'm not sure why they didn't t- talk about it before, but he seems, he seems very excited to be able to do this for some reason. Mm-hmm. Um, and picks up the phone to call, un- uh, call uncle. I'm thinking of your comic now, uh, <laughs> call Bruce, uh, to let him know. And then he hears, he hears Bruce's voice only it's not coming from the phone. Well, lo and behold, Bruce, Alfred and aunt Harriet decided to, Cause they knew, you know, Batman knows everything. He knew the weather would turn bad. So he decided to fly them all. Don't know if it's the bat plane or not, right? but flew them all. In. It couldn't have been cause it was Aunt Harriet. Um, oh, right. flew them all to, to spend Christmas with Dick. And, uh, and so Lori invites everybody to go to their house. So they're, they're all, they're all standing there around, uh, the, the piano singing some sort of Christmas carol. Mm-hmm. But before that, Dick. Dick, a very disappointed Dick Grayson says to, to this, to this situation, the fact that the people he wanted to go spend Christmas with have arrived, surprised him. And now we're going to spend Christmas with him and Lori anyway at Lori's 
parents' house says about it, super. (laughs) (laughs) At least least that's how I interpret the way he says it. Mm -hmm. And they all say, Merry Christmas, Dick Grayson, and go into a (laughs) chorus of Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Well, see, that's just the weird thing. Um, at the very, at the v- the very last panel, uh, transitions from that super mm-hmm. comment, and it just says the caption box says, "And so dot dot dot," and that's where you see them uh, singing around the 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 uh, the piano, jingle bells, jingle bells, mm-hmm. the end, the end. <laughs> I I think we all know what the deal is. Dick Grayson is a college student, and he's a horn dog. That's all there is. <laughs> I was, you know, not going to say it explicitly, George, but, you know. Oh, we've this, got, we've got to let everybody know. Uh, this no, is, this no, is a no family-friendly podcast. That's if true. I may, if I may uh, uh, borrow uh, one of your phrases. I was going to say I know nothing about family-friendly <laughs> podcasts. Oh, you Dick Grayson, you scallywag. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like a heck of a lot of fun. How many, how many stories would have been in something like that? Four? Three? Four? In in the, the the giant book, yeah, in a giant size uh, Batman family. Oh, because they do they, they did try to. Well, they fit, had to, fit a lot in those things, didn't they? Yeah, there was there was a a, a new Batgirl story. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I forgot about this. There actually is um, a, a two pages. Is it just two pages? Yeah, two pages. And I found this online. Um, actually, had a post on my website about this about mm-hmm. Robin costumes. Uh-huh. There, there was a, a two-page spread of reader contributions for new Robin costumes. Also, show George real quick here on the video. Okay. All right. Like you said, this is a nostalgia time of year. Yeah, I, I miss stuff like that too. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. I love that kind of stuff. I know. All you have to do is go to Etsy or. If Zazzle still exists, or you just go to a convention and you see people's fan art and whatever, but there's something about having those pinup pages like that in a comic that I don't know. It add, it added to the fun, took the seriousness out of it a little bit. You know, mm-hmm. you can still have your story, but that's just back matter. You know, it, it made you feel like a part of it. Mm-hmm. You know, that you could actually submit something and they'd publish it. And yeah, just seeing just just you flashing that up right now is. Uh, just puts a smile on my face. So, so th- this is great. I love this stuff. And then there's there's two more Batman stories. One is uh, as they as they remember how they used to say this, George, a complete full length novel. Yeah. Oh, hmm. <laughs> I love that for a I you know, which is probably a twenty four page story, right? Exactly. Like that. Yeah. So yeah, you get you get uh, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, basically stories one mm-hmm. one of which is or at least no uh, probably two of them are reprints mm. but you know no big deal mm-hmm. yeah I, lo- I love these old comics that was a good book man i like that all right now this one here this one i mean this could be the topic of a show in and of itself this one so i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna do my best to just i'm, I'm just gonna go for it okay I'm, I, I gotta explain this one though really quick when I go to comic conventions, like a lot of us, you, your listeners, let's face it, we all have tons and tons of comics. Probably some we haven't read. Like you said, you just had two issues there you haven't read. I mean, I don't know when they came into your possession, but it's not like those comics came out yesterday. You may have only res- bought them in the last couple of months. A couple of years, yeah. A couple of years, um, which helps to prove my point that we probably could totally stop buying for a while and still have a ton of things to read and keep us occupied throughout the next calendar year. A lot of us are probably in that boat. First world problem, right? So when I go to a convention, if I'm going to buy any comics or if I'm going to even go through back issue bins, I want to find something that's a little odd, a little unique, maybe something new to me that I didn't even know existed, or maybe I was aware of, but Because my tastes have changed over time. When I was a teenager, I would never have picked it up off the rack, but now I'm curious. And we all know how comic book prices are. You can get something from a dollar bin. Something could be 15 bucks, 40 bucks, a a, a wall book for a couple of hundred. But when you think about it, in today's marketplace, a new comic is upwards to four or five bucks. A graphic novel or a trade paperback could be 20 bucks, 30 bucks. So if you're willing to spend that kind of money, on on that, you might be willing to spend the same amount on an older book. 
and take a chance on something you never would have read before. I don't know. uh, I bought this a a couple of years ago, I think at the Baltimore Comic Con. Don't ask me what the store was. I was going through a box and I found this book. I did not know it existed. And I picked it up, A, because of the curiosity factor of the title, but B, because it had a holiday themed cover. So the holiday themed cover right there caught my eye. And the fact that I had never heard of this book before. Just just made it a must buy for me. Uh, let's see. It's marked twelve bucks. I think I probably got it in a fifty fifty percent bin. So for six dollars, I got this comic book that was cover dated February nineteen seventy seven. So it came out Christmas time seventy six. I figured not bad. I could spend ten dollars on a book and not enjoy it today. So let, let's spend. Oh, I mean, I'm sorry. Six bucks on a book that just came out and not enjoy it, I'll take a risk on something from the 70s and have a little fun. It has remained in the comic book bag ever since I bought it, and I never broke the seal. And because we were doing this episode, I said, and I knew where this book was, I said, I am reading this book specifically for this episode and this discussion with Eric. Eric, have you ever heard of the book Fast Willie Jackson? Uh, no. Okay. Tell me about Fast Willie Jackson, will you please? Well, I, I, and I'll admit, I don't normally go out to Google and Wikipedia to look up stuff. Uh, even if, I, if I'm very curious, I, I, I don't usually have the mobile device near me. And uh, I will say this, I, I'm going to go out there and do some research. Unfortunately, I haven't done it yet in preparation for this show. But I thought I had enough content here that I didn't need to look this up. So any of your listeners, if you want to go look up Fast Willie Jackson, be my guest. But I have Fast Willie Jackson number three. Wait, wait, this is a series? It is a series. It came out from a company (laughs) called Fitzgerald Periodicals. And it is, um, I'll just say it, it's the urban version of Archie. The characters are drawn in an Archie style. Okay. But they're all from the ghetto. So picture, I don't know, the Archie version of the TV show Good Times. Okay. Or a, maybe not quite Fat Albert and the Cosby Kids, because the characters are drawn more in an Archie fashion than a TV cartoon fashion. But, and, and there are more stereotypes in, in this book than you would, than you would find in a cartoon, I think, even though there, there were stereotypes back then, this one, it's pretty blatant. Maybe you could call it black exploitation. I'm not sure. Could be a little cringeworthy, especially when it comes to the dialogue. Although I, I will forgive the dialogue only because I'll bet in that Batman family, there was some slang of the time used, especially by Robin. I don't, oh, sure. I, I don't know that for sure, but there's a lot of slang in this comic book that I'm not quite sure people would use today, uh, but it is of the time and it lets you know, like if you read a comic from the sixties and people are saying groovy and Hey, that cat is really hip and all that stuff. That's what the jargon and the lingo was of the time. So that is prevalent in this book. I don't know who the artists are on any of the stories, although the cover art is by somebody named G. Lemoyne. And the, uh, the logo, Fast Willie Jackson, and in the logo, there's a headshot of a black Santa saying, can you dig it? Oh, man. To a white Santa replying, yeah, I can dig it. Just to give you an idea. Now, probably when it's not a Christmas episode, I'll bet there are two headshots up there with two people saying, can you dig it? A la what Archie would do sometimes in the logo when there would be pictures of the Archies or pictures of Josie and the pussycat up by the, uh, by the logo. Mm -hmm. And the cover is fast. Willie Jackson is asking his friend Hannibal why Frankie gets all the girls. Now Frankie is over in the corner by a Christmas tree surrounded by all these girls and he is dressed like a pimp and hannibal's answer to fast willie jackson's question is and remember the question was what does frankie have that i don't have hannibal says 
just about every foxy mama in Moe's City. Now, I'm going to show you this picture. Oh, my gosh. And again, use it for your site. This is an audio medium, but here it is. I haven't shown you a picture of any of the other comics I've got. But, ah. but there it is. Now, if you notice, down by the leg of Frankie is a girl who is holding Frankie like around the leg with a present in her hand. And, I mean, it's not suggestive in any way, except this reminds me of like a Frank Frazetta sword and sorcery mm, painting okay. where the girl was always holding on to the yeah, yeah. Conan-like character's leg. Or even Princess Leia was almost doing it in some of the original artwork from Star Wars, if I, if I remember some of the original artwork right. uh, for, from back yeah. then. Uh, so, so it's not suggestive in any, in any, any way, but it's again an objectification that I don't think we would tolerate today. So let me tell you a little bit about Fast Willie Jackson and how once again I got hornswoggled because Eric, there is very little about Christmas in this issue, and the only reason I kept it on here is because I know you would never have heard of Fast Willie Jackson. <laughs> no, no. But but we'll go we'll go real fast. Well, wait, wait before you get to that, George. Mm-hmm. I, cause I, as you've been talking, I've been looking up pictures of the fast Willie Jackson comic. Okay. And <laughs> Let's get into it. Well, what I'm, what I'm struck by though, is this looks just like Archie comic art. Oh yeah. Is it, is it, is it by the same artist or are they just totally ripping off? I mean, unless Archie you, comics? unless you, I think it's a rip off because the company is called Fitzgerald periodicals. Yeah, I, unless this is so weird. Unless they're a division of Archie trying to separate themselves for some reason, I don't know. There's no, uh, there are no credits, and I don't see any artist marks, even a last name on any of the panels. So uh, it would take a little digging, I guess. We could all, we'll, we'll always find out uh, who did this, but you're right, it is in the vein of Archie, but it's urban Archie. Okay. On the back cover of this particular issue, and I will send you a cop- uh, picture of it. There is a solicitation to subscribe to the book. And there are a bunch of characters standing there with little place cards in front of them to tell you what their names are. I'm going to tell you about some of those people here now, so I'm not going to go through all that. But this picture will be a nice picture for you to put on the site so everybody could see who the main characters are, a la Archie, Jughead, Betty, Veronica, you know, that that kind of thing Mm -hmm. in in the fast Willie Jackson world. All right, let's, let's get on to it. Story one, let's dance, Officer Flagg. Now, Officer Flagg is Caucasian, and the first panel is a a music is blaring from a city building that looks like a ghetto type of building. And he thinks to himself, and I quote, I know they're up to something up there, gambling or drinking. Oh, I'm sorry, gambling or drinking wine. Who knows what else? So already, this, this comic is 40 years old. I mean, it's not like we don't know what was going on in this, what's been going on in this country for hundreds of years. But I'm telling you, <laughs> this comic is it, it doesn't pull any punches on anything. On on, uh, but but it makes you wonder. Sometimes when I read the dialogue, I wonder who is writing this. Like, what is the background of the person writing this? Yeah, right. Yeah. I, obviously, it's an Archie ripoff, but. Who is writing this? It's almost like sometimes when the we, we in, in the comics world we have accused the sixty year old man trying to write the fourteen year old superhero mm-hmm. yeah. and, and trying to get the lingo <laughs> right, right? So there, there's a which I think lends itself to stereotype. He goes into the building and he says, "Listen to that racket. They can't be doing anything worthwhile in there." Now, of course, all they're doing is they're playing their instruments. They're a band a la the Archies. I don't know what the band is I was just going to say, yeah. That's all they do. Now, officer, oh, and then uh, for some some reason, the officer makes a sound in the hallway, and they hear it, and they guess that it's Officer Flag getting set to make a big bust. That was a quote, by the way, getting set to make a big bust. Officer Flag recognizes that the noise sounds almost like music. And he begins dancing in the hall, being reminded of getting out of the army in 1955 
and dancing the jitterbug to the Maguire sisters. Then he starts dancing with Dee Dee, one of the main characters, in the hallway, and the story ends. They're all friends, right? They're all friends, but of course he said, you know, tomorrow is another day. But for right now, we're friends because you're playing music and I'm dancing with Dee Dee in the hallway. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Story, wow. story number two is one of those uh, two-page gags like you would see in an Archie comic book. That's a kind of a quick joke, maybe 10 panels. Uh, Jose, who owns the local – now, Jose would be the fill-in for Pop Tate from the Archie comics world. And uh, his diner, uh, the chocolate shop, was the one in Archie. The one in this book is the Spanish Main. Now – the uh, just offhandedly, he mentions the Christmas season, and there are wreaths in the background. And Eric, this is the only story that references Christmas in, in any way. So they two page gag. There's a wreath on the wall in the store, and the kids sitting at at the uh, diner bar say something about it being the Christmas season. That's it. Huh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Again, bamboozled, I'm telling you. Okay, story number three. Fast Willie in the shakes. Willie is shaking convulsively for no reason <laughs> when he's hanging out with his friends near the storefront of Sister Zola's fortune telling shop. She sees this as an opportunity to bilk the boys and says it's Satan's work and she can help. The guys know she's a fraud. Uh, but they go inside her shop anyway, and I quote, this is a quote, now cross my palm with the long green, which means pay me money, and then she'll give him some magic seeds to, to uh, fix whatever the shaking is. They're about to leave when Zola's granddaughter, Cleo, is, who is visiting from the West Indies with the out-of-sight accent, introduces herself. Willie miraculously stops shaking all of a sudden. They can't figure out why, and they think that Cleo is a witch. Okay, so now, first of all, they think Sister Zola is a fraud as a fortune teller, but they immediately think Cleo is a witch because the guy stopped shaking, right? So, how they- totally makes sense. Yeah, of course. But, but they have to find out how, right? <laughs> so how are they going to find out? Well, Frankie, the pimp, the, the guy who dresses like a pimp, should take her out on a date and find out. And then the story, then it says, okay. then it says the end, right? It doesn't say to be continued. What? It's the end. What? Story number four is Frankie's night out. So it's a continuation. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. The guys tell Frankie he has to ask Cleo to the rock concert, but he's so cool. He's never asked the girl out before. They always ask him. So Hannibal, one of the other characters in the book, does the asking for him. And she says, yes. But now they have to get the tickets for the rock concert. So they call. They can't go online. This is the 70s. They call, and they find out that the concert is sold out. Uh-oh, what are they going to do? Coincidentally, Cleo comes to the Spanish main where they're hanging out. She knew that's where they were because she wanted to hang out with them. And as she walks through the door, what appears in the threshold of the doorway as she walks by? Two tickets to the rock concert. And they're like, that's weird. Where did those come from? Is she really a witch? So Frankie <laughs> takes her out to the concert. Oh, and they run, they run out in fear of her, thinking she's a witch. She wanted to hang out with them, and they, they, they just leave her uh, because they think she's a witch. But they take the two concert tickets so that Frankie could take her <laughs> later the night. <laughs> Frankie meets up with the guys after the concert and says he's a complete failure because not one girl at the concert asked him out on a date which has never happened to him before. He's been out on dates before and other women just walk up to him apparently like the Fonz and say, you know, I want to date you or start kissing him or whatever. So of course, it has been determined that Cleo must be a witch. The end. Eric, this is not addressed anywhere else in the issue. <laughs> oh my gosh. Nowhere else. So... Why did the guy have the shakes? Where did the tickets come from? Has Frankie been jinxed in some way? We'll never know unless this is... We'll never know. 
<laughs> this might be their odd way of having a continuing serialized story, and you'd have to publish ah, your number four. Who knows? I, I don't see. know. Yeah. Very, very strange. Wow. Then there's a three-page gag about Frankie's pip, pimp out and fit versus uh, another character, Jabbar's Dashiki. And then there's a six-page story that essentially details how the band was created, which kind of like what you were saying before about one of, uh, one of your uh, – uh, about the title of the Robin story being a little backwards. I would have mm-hmm. thought the origin story of the band should have happened before the police officer wanted to shut the band down because it wasn't really told as a flashback time type of thing. The guys were just stand, standing there saying, what do you want to do when you grow up? Well, I want to be this, that, or the other thing. One guy said, I want to be a rock star. So then they start making fun of them and then eventually they form a band. So I thought that that was a little backwards to do it that way. Then there's the one... Maybe. Go ahead. Maybe they just had a couple of pages to to fill for that issue. <laughs> then there's a one page ad, uh, one page ad, a one page gag on the inside back cover. Willie's aunt, oh God, I don't even want to tell you this one, but okay, I'm going to tell you. Willie's Willie's aunt Millie and Mister Brown will be visiting for the weekend. So Dee Dee asks, "Why do you call your aunt Aunt Millie, but you call your uncle Mister Brown?" And he said, well, he wants me to call him that. And she she said, well, what's his name? And he said, well, because his name is Tom. I see the eyebrow going up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is what passed. I, I don't know. I, anyway, uh, th- that was it. Now, there, there were no ads in the book except for one ad for a Golden Legacy Illustrated History book to learn more about black history. Oh, okay. that was so otherwise there were no ads in the books. It was just story, story, story. So well, is there something redeeming about this comic. Yeah. <laughs> so, it, uh, so again, not, not too holiday themed, even though the cover makes you think it's going to be a Christmas themed issue, mm-hmm. but if nothing else, it was a history lesson. Mm-hmm. That's why I felt, you know what, again, that's why I stuck with my original comics that I pulled, even, <laughs> even though I was surprised <laughs> how they lacked Christmas well, themes, except for the brave and the bold. Think about it, George. It It's, it's like, it is very much like Christmas because you have something wrapped in this pretty color, colorful paper and you open it up <laughs> and you might get, you know, the, the, the wonderful toy surprise that you wanted for Christmas, or you might get, you know, socks or something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And, and the trump, <laughs> I will say one other thing. There were, uh, besides four, okay, so there were, there were the African American main characters. There was the Latin gentleman and his uh, daughter, I guess, uh, who owned the diner. And the Caucasian people in the book uh, were Officer Flag, who obviously discriminates against everybody in the neighborhood. And a character who didn't appear in any story, but she was on that back cover I was telling you about that I'll send you. And her name was Ms. Jane Fronda. What? Mm-hmm. So I would love to read a story with Ms. Jane Fronda in it. And she was the only one. Well, no, I, I'm not going to say that uh, because the the owner of the store, his full name was used. I was going to say that hers was the only na- full name that was used, you know, first name, last name, but I, I, I'd be wrong about that. Uh, but I thought that that was kind of funny. I would have been very curious to see how she's depicted in the book. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, oh, this, I, I am, <laughs> <laughs> I am intrigued and I don't know this is, this is a w- bizarre, a it bizarre is. concept to me. And only now that we're talking about it, I, I, I mean, I have, I have comic, uh, price guides, uh, over the years and I've got the new one. But I mean, I could have simply, I guess, looked in, in, in it to see how long a run this had, or I could have looked it up. Uh, but this was issue number three, so it at least lasted three issues. <laughs> well, I, as as you were talking, uh, describing the comic, George, I was I was frantically looking up uh, on the Internet uh, what this was all about. Because I, I had, as you were describing that cover and whatnot, mm-hmm. I had to see for myself what what, what this was. And I, uh, ran across a, a blog called Blog Into Mystery. Uh-huh. And they have a, they have a, uh, a Black History Month posting, uh, about this comic. Oh, no way. 
the series, yeah. And so your 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 guess about uh, the the, the uh, Fitzgerald Publishing Company, mm-hmm. maybe it was the the the, the person who owned it uh, may have written some of these. I think you said that before, and apparently you were you were right. Uh, so apparently it was written. The the series was uh, written in spurts by company owner Bertram Fitzgerald, huh. uh, who likely wrote the whole series. It says. And they talk a little bit about the this being Black Archie, mm-hmm. and the series artist was Gus uh, Lemoyne. Oh yeah, he did the co- he did sign the cover. Okay, yeah. and apparently he he had some Archie credits. Oh good, to his oh, name okay. it says makes sense. Yeah. yeah, when you see that artwork, it definitely makes sense. Yeah, I that's that's what when when I first saw them, like that's what threw me. It's like oh my god, this this did Archie comics do this and then put it out under a different publishing company or something oh. it it yeah this is i'm very intrigued and and uh i want to know more about this so i might have to do some research <laughs> on my own <laughs> it, it was it was interesting when i found it in that back issue bin i had never heard of it before and it just hit all the bells especially since there was uh, a christmas tree on the cover and there was the the tease that it might be a christmas themed issue a la Archie's Christmas Spectaculars and the Betty and Veronica stocking stuff or whatever they were called at the time. So, uh, again, I was fooled. The judging a book by its cover, literally, figuratively, metaphorically, however you want to say it. But again, a nice history lesson. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I, I, I think, um, I think you put, uh, put my choices to shame, George, with that one. Oh, no, sure. I don't. Th- well, uh, here I only have thirty three percent that are really holiday themed, so no, not at all. <laughs> well, my my final choice here, um, at least for the the particular issue that I'm going to talk about, is a DC Comics presents issue. So I'm going back to Superman now. Uh, so Superboy, Robin, and now Superman. Uh, this is DC Comics presents number sixty seven with a seventy five cent cover price. Mm-hmm. Oh, and the uh, Fast Willie Jackson was thirty cents. 30 cents. Wow. From uh, okay. December 1976. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, that was a cheap comic. Yeah. Um, uh, so this this comic, uh, DC Comics Presents number 67, was published uh, on December 8th, 1983. Mm. And this features a team up between Superman and oh. everyone's favorite Santa Claus. Mm-hmm. Actual Santa Claus. In a story called Twas the Fright Before Christmas. Dun, dun, dun. This this is by Len Wein, E. Nelson Bridwell, Kurt Swan, Murphy Anderson, Ben Oda, Gene De- uh, uh, D'Angelo, with a cover by the wonderful and great Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. Oh, man. So we talked about Jim Aparo's Batman. Garcia Lopez's Superman. Yeah. Oh, man. Beautiful. Me. What a beautiful cover, too. Yeah. I, I, you know, the art in by Kurt Swan and Murphy Anderson, you know, good, but I, I would have preferred... Uh, um, uh, Garcia Lopez <laughs> sure. on the interiors, but you know, whatever. Uh, so this is a bizarre and, and, and on the cover, uh, Superman's carrying a bag smile on his face, you know, a bag full of presents, presumably helping Santa out and, uh, behind a chimney on, on this house is toy man poised to strike. <laughs> so you, you could kind of get a sense of, of what's going to happen in this story. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, the story opens up with Superman just kind of flying down because there's this boy threatening a sidewalk Santa, you know, the ringing the bell, trying to get some donations. And he's got this, uh, 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 what do you call those little toy guns that shoot the little. Oh, like a cap gun. Not, not a cap cap gun. Uh, the little sticker things, uh, they stick to your head. If you shoot them at your forehead, you know what I'm talking about? Oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. I mean, it's not a plunger gun, but I mean, essentially a plunger is shot. Yeah. 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 I had, I had a ton of those when I was a kid. I don't know what they're called. Yeah. Weird that I don't know that, but (laughs) anyway, so yeah, uh, Superman sees this, this, uh, stick up happening Mm -hmm. with, between this little boy and, and Santa and he, you know, he helps put a stop to it. I mean, there was no real danger there. It was just a toy gun after all, Mm -hmm. but, uh, the the uh, Superman for some reason decides to x you know uses X ray vision on the gun, and he spots some sort of sec- uh, secret mechanism inside, uh, and it's uh, oh it's it's emitting a low grade radiation 
on the boy, which is in turn causing him to act out of nature. Oh. And because he keeps saying the same thing over and over and over again to this sidewalk Santa, just hand your money, hand over all your money or. And and so Superman decides to, um, much like Superboy did with Bash Bashford, uh-huh. kidnap this young boy. I mean, take him to his <laughs> fortress of solitude to investigate. I see, I see a pattern here with Superman, George. There's this guy's a little creepy. He's lucky there weren't Amber uh, Alerts back then. Yeah, right. Yeah, jeez. So yeah, he he uh, he uh, um, uh, takes a look at the boy with this kind of uh, like a like an eye. You know, when you go to the uh, the the eye doctor and they have you look through the little oh. lenses and stuff, it kind of looks like that. But anyway, um, he the boy snaps out of it and tells his story about what happened, how he found these toys in his parents' closet, and that's that's where these the 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 the, the toy gun with the radiation he finds. And of course, Superman guesses who's behind this, uh, and then he decides to take the boy back so that he can go pursue Toy Man, presumably. And one of the toys that the boy is carrying, awkwardly, as as Superman is carrying the boy in in his cape, and I'll show George on the video here. I don't know if you can see that, mm. but so yeah, that toy is just kind of sticking out awkwardly in the panel. You know, it's just it's just, it's just a plot contrivance because it blasts Superman with this super gravity ray out of this little toy mm-hmm. Superman plummets to the earth, but manages to uh, protect the boy from being killed, but he's unconscious. And uh, so the boy's trying to wake him up and it's not helping. He's starting to freak out. And lo and behold, some little people show up mm. and they've, they've got pointed ears and uh, beards and they're dressed a little kind of strangely, you know, mm-hmm. for, for this time period. But they take Superman back and uh, cut to a scene with, with Toy Man and, you know, it's, it is him and he's out to, you know, ruin Superman's Christmas or, you know, kill him either way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, S- Superman wakes up uh, and sees these, these elves and lo and behold, he, he sees it's Kris Kringle. Mm. He's been rescued by Santa's elves. <laughs> and, even, and Santa even says, but most folks, uh, oh, my name is Kringle, friend Superman, Chris Kringle. <laughs> but most folks prefer to call me Santa Claus. Ho, 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 ho. That was good. <laughs> I, I got to tell you, that was good. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, yeah, so so then Santa decides to uh, show Superman and the boy around, shows him the workshop. Uh, and and curious, so this is, this is 1984 mm-hmm. or, you know, end of 1983 when this comes out. And, uh, it's, it's, uh, the, the, they show the elves at a bank of computers and, and they even, they even make a comment about the wonders of the computer age. And they've got these monitors, um, that, well, the, the, one of the monitors shows Toy Man working on some gadget, you know, so they're spying on Toy Man <laughs> from, from Santa's workshop, you know. Cause he's on the naughty list. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But yeah, it, it actually reminded me uh, a bit of I don't know if you've seen the uh, the new holiday uh, classic uh, Arthur Christmas, George. Yes, yes, I have seen Arthur Christmas. Yeah, so mm-hmm. it kind of reminded me of that, yeah. you know, because the 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 son, uh, the the older son of 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 Santa is trying to bring the whole operation into the modern age, and it kind of reminded me of that only mm-hmm. you know thirty years <laughs> earlier. <laughs> And so all this, all this uh, hustle and bustle of the elves making toys uh, spurs a memory in Superman's mind about when he was a baby on Krypton when he had this toy. Uh, it was uh, some sort of holographic thing. It, it says it, it was capable of transforming my own brain waves into realistic holographic images. What a shame it was destroyed when Krypton exploded. Mm. Spoiler alert, George. This will come back later in the story. Mm-hmm. So uh, they, uh, uh, Santa decides to give Superman a lift because he's still weak from this gravity beam thing that, that Toy Man unleashed upon him. And uh, they end up going to where Toy Man is to break up whatever it is he's doing. And then we get a, a few pages of a fight between Superman and a bunch of toys that not only is he weakened by the gravity beam, George, but... Toy Man somehow has acquired some kryptonite and some of the toys, uh, their weapons are kryptonite laced or something. And so that's causing Superman a lot of problem. 
you know, otherwise this fight would be over in two seconds. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, even Superman is worried. He says, I'll be in no condition to worry about anything ever again. If the, if he doesn't deal, deal with this, you know, very quickly. And that's when, uh, Santa and the elves help by unleashing a bunch of Santa toys that take care of toy man's toys. And, and uh, it's, what, what amazes me about this is this, this fight scene between essentially toys and Superman goes on for like five pages of this comic. So you couldn't get away with that today. Yeah. Yeah. That would, that probably wouldn't, yeah. wouldn't fly. And then, uh, you know, they, they take care of toy man and, uh, uh, Superman helps Santa Claus out by going, going to all of the, the good little girls and boys who somehow got toy man's tainted toys. Mm. And so he goes and replaces them all with toys from Santa, mm-hmm. you know, doing the whole creepy thing again, because he's going into people's you know little, little children's bedrooms and <laughs> stealing toys and replace, but at least he's replacing them. Mm-hmm. I'll give him that one. Mm-hmm. But, uh, so so they're about ready to um, – uh, uh, Superman's about ready to take uh, uh, Tim – is it Tim? It is Tim. Right, right. I'm looking at my notes here. Hold on a second. Where is it? Yes, Tim. The boy The boy in the story is named Tim. Is he short? So – yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. But he's not – but he's not – he's not, uh, you know – He's not uh, minuscule? Lame, like, like, like Timmy mm-hmm. or uh, Tiny Tim. Right. You know. Mm-hmm. So um, – He's a, he he's about ready to take Tim back home, and then that same stupid toy that blasts him in the first place somehow Tim still has it, and then it it blasts Superman again. Uh, Superman falls back, and suddenly they're back in the Arctic where he first landed at the beginning of the story, George. Mm. And and Superman says, "All I can remember is the wild dream I was having." There were reindeer and elves and, and, and believe it or not, there was Santa Claus. And so, uh, Superman takes Tim home. He, uh, Superman himself goes back to 344 Clinton street, his, uh, Clark Kent's apartment. And, uh, he's reaching into his, his secret pocket, uh, in his cape, you know, where he keep, he keeps his Clark Kent clothes because he, he's going to change mm-hmm. and go to a party, you know, with Lana and others. And then George, he pulls out great Krypton. He says, it's, it's the old hollow toy my father made for me. The one I thought destroyed, but that's impossible. Isn't it? And then the very last panel is, you know, cause this is a hollow toy. It reads the, his thoughts apparently. Uh-huh. And so his thought, George, is that Santa Claus is holding up a sign that says, Merry Christmas, Superman. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, I love it. I love it. Quite honestly, George, mm-hmm. when, uh, you know, because the DC Comics presents issues that I have, mm-hmm. I only have, I don't have a complete run. I only bought the team ups of characters that I wanted to get, you know, specific characters I like mm-hmm. uh, or oddball characters. And this is definitely one of those. It's like right. Superman and Santa Claus together. Right. How does that work? And so I, I had to get this it, issue. Right. <laughs> I must buy it. And now I now I see how it works and it's lame and, and wonderful at the same time. It is. And I, I I know this has come up when you and I have been together, but I've I said it on my show too. Comics like that where a kid could just pick up a Superman comic, read it, have a one and done, even if there was some running subplot, or maybe a two part story. It, it it's not as simple for a kid to just pick up Superman number, what was that, 62 or uh, of DC Comics present, you, presents you just have there? 67. Yeah. It, a kid can't do that. And not like a kid would because most kids have to be dragged to the comic book store and introduced to it by their parents because they can't just get it at 7-Eleven or the gas station or whatever. Uh, but issues like that are fun and should be introduced to kids who are just reading now because it that's fun you you and i think about it too much you, you know you know we make jokes here and there but <laughs> hey a kid at 10 12 years old they'll love that story especially this time of year i i, I love it it's oh just, I, you know it's 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 also fun to make a little bit of fun of uh, about if, it too. if i can't take that issue out of those boxes before christmas this year i'll, I'll find it in another dollar bin somewhere <laughs> <laughs> oh man Oh, that was that was a lot of fun. And no backup. 
Oh, in this one, no. Okay. So that no, was. I don't believe they. A novel, no, a full, novel length story. A novel length story, as they say. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, that's a lot of fun, man. One one thing I neglected to tell you about Fast Willie Jackson, just just for a moment uh, to go back to him. I read the letters page, and mm-hmm. because the book was geared toward younger kids, I think uh, the letters were really more three sentences, four sentences saying how much they loved the first issue of the book. Reading the the slang and the lingo and, and the jargon in there, I wouldn't be surprised if Mr. Fitzgerald didn't write those letters himself. <laughs> the letters themselves, not the responses, the letters. There were no responses. Oh, 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 okay. Although there was a personal message to somebody that made it sound like a, a letter was sent to them that might have had a serious problem. And all they said was something like, Talk to somebody about it because um, you, you shouldn't be made to feel bad about that, whatever that is. They didn't get into specifics, but oh. it was one of those things almost like, you know who we're talking to. We're talking to you, and this is the one sentence of advice we can give you for whatever the real serious problem is that you may have written to us about. So that was a little curious oh. that they would have even done that. But I mean, you know, you've got a groovy book. I really think. Uh, Fast Willie is is uh, whatever the jargon for the bomb would have been in in the in the seventies. It was just it just didn't seem like real people, even even kids of the of the day, would have written a letter with the with those terms and phrases in it. It would be what an adult would have expected a kid to say. You know what I mean? So speaking of yeah, speaking of George, you said you know whatever the equivalent of the bomb is, mm-hmm. that would have been. If I'm not mistaken, dynamite. Yeah. You know what? I think somebody did put dynamite in there. See, <laughs> again, I think somebody was just watching good times and taking, taking the yeah. slang right out of there. <laughs> oh man. I bring up the letters column because I have two honorable mentions. I know we're going very, very long, but do you mind if I talk about them really quick? No, go right ahead. Like I was saying, I was trying to find books in my long boxes and I got lucky that I came across what I did. Uh, what I also came across, uh, was an issue of Marvel Age. Do you remember Marvel Age, the official oh, Marvel yes. News magazine? I used to love that. I loved that, yeah. It, so even though the cover has the Marvel Age logo with the candy cane red and white stripes, and uh, Forbish Man, has a, he, he's popping out of a wreath in the, in the corner box, and it, it's solicited as, as a special Christmas issue spotlighting Marvel's graphic novels. I mean, it's really an early version of Marvel previews, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, So the cover is Gru, Sergio Aragonis is Gru. He apparently destroyed a Christmas tree to use the wood as as a skewer for some obscure animal that he's roasting over an open fire. And all these kids with ornaments are behind him crying because he did that, that he destroyed their (laughs) tree. So that's, that's what that's about. So the only reason I wanted to bring this up real quick was uh, it was cover dated April 1988, and it had a 50 cent cover price. And I just wanted to talk about a couple of the things that were solicited in there, real quick, just for nostalgia purposes. Like you were saying, the holidays are nostalgia time. Uh, graphic novels were new, relatively new to the marketplace at the time, but a lot of them had come out by uh, by this point in uh, late 1987, and a lot more came out than I remembered came out i mean sure we all know the death of captain marvel new mutants x-men god loves man kills Mm -hmm. but i forgot about oh well dazzler the movie i think had just come out uh but there were uh there there was uh there were a bunch of them but one in particular was called super boxers by ron wilson who used to do marvel two-in-one and I, I think I've got that, but I was like, Ron, Ron Wilson, you know, I'm not, not sure I would have read a graphic novel with his artwork in it, but you know what? Uh, I think I've got it upstairs somewhere. So I might dig that out. And there was a thing Hulk graphic novel written by Jim Starlin with artwork by Bernie Wrightson. Wow. And I think it was called the big change. And I believe I have that too, but I don't remember it. So that it would be nice to rediscover that. So a lot of things that came out back then when the graphic novel was a new form, 
I don't think have been reprinted a lot. It, mm-hmm. Some of the more popular things have, but I know IDW now is finally reprinting Swar- Swords of the Swashbucklers. Uh, it started as a graphic novel, went into a couple of issue series. I forget how, how much. But I mean, that, that was a Marvel graphic novel. Uh, so it was very interesting to see all this stuff. And then they wrote articles about them. And they wanted to introduce the reader to the concept of graphic novels and the, the new concept of the hardcover Marvel masterworks. Now, did you ever have any of those when they first came? I did not. No. I'm, no. I couldn't afford them, George. But you know when I got them? I got them as Christmas <laughs> and birthday gifts. Ah, that, very that's, nice. that's how I got them because people your, knew. Your family loved you better than they loved me. My family loved me. <laughs> well, it was an easy thing. They knew they knew I liked it. It was just a matter of could they get the right characters, and they always seemed to hit the mark. So, uh, According to Jim Salakrup, and I don't know if I'm ever pronouncing his name right, but in Salakrup's section, he says, This issue spotlights our entire line of graphic novels, and it educates us on the Marvel Masterworks. Also, he apparently didn't like the term Marvel Zombie. And I'm guessing, <laughs> I, think this is, I think this is a debate that was going on within Marvel Age for a couple of months, people going back and forth about, no, no, it's a good thing. We're Marvel Zombies. We're good. No, it was derogatory created by the DC people. You know, it, it was just crazy. Very interesting. Uh, there was a Christmas issue solicited in here, actually two. X-Men number 229. By Claremont, Silvestri, and Dan Green for seventy-five cents, uh, and uh, there was a Spider-Man issue with X-Man. I, I never really got into X-Man, but apparently he appeared in a Christmas issue. And you know what comic they were soliciting that was going to come out in the following month? Amazing Spider-Man number three hundred, the first appearance of some character called Venom. Oh wow. Uh, there was a uh, there was a top. Who knew? Yeah, I know, right? They they had a top ten <laughs> list. Uh, they had a Stan soapbox. They had a Willie Lumpkin uh, four panel comic by Stanley and Dan DiCarlo, and they had a two page Fred Hendeck comic promoting Marvel graphic novels. So a lot of cool stuff in there in that in the Marvel yeah. page. Yeah, that that's actually one title where I've I've often thought I'm going to try and go find some of those. Mm-hmm. It is interesting to read the solicits. It's like having an old previews hanging around the house. Is, is what, and some of the articles are, are, are pretty fun. It's basically a, a book of ads anyway, but there was an ad for a Doctor Who magazine subscription to celebrate the 25th year of Doctor Who. <laughs> 25, yeah. <laughs> and, and the back cover was a full-page ad for new monthly fun with ALF. I remember ALF, uh, Alf. The, the show and the comic. Mm-hmm. So uh, that was a lot of fun to, to dig that out. And in, in the vein of uh, the Archie comics, I found a very well-read issue of Archie Giant Series Magazine, number 219 from December 1973, presenting Little Jinx Christmas Grab Bag. Now, did you ever read Little Jinx before? I don't. Here it is. It sound very familiar. I'll send you a picture. It's very well-read. When people say well-read, okay. this is well-read. Yeah, I can see a little bit of that. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's all bent up. A drawing on the cover. There's a there's a puzzle page in there. I did the maze. There's a maze in there, and I actually did it. Uh, there's uh, words to unscramble. I didn't unscramble them in the book. It, it, it's a typical Christmas Arch, Archie type Christmas issue. There was a uh, one main story where rich girl Gigi kind of poo-poos everything that the kids want for Christmas. Uh, She's a rich kid, but her parents are divorced, so she has two mommies, two daddies. She doesn't know whether she's going to spend Christmas with the one in the French Riviera or the one in the the Bahamas or whatever. And it turns out none of her parents want to spend Christmas with her, so she's stuck at home alone with the servants, even though she turned down Little Jinx's invitation to the big holiday party at her house. But lo and behold... I bring you tidings of great joy, Eric, because little Jinx doesn't give up. She calls on Christmas Eve anyway, hoping she would still be home and she would change her mind. And Gigi does just that. And as the kids all get together, they wish a happy, uh, happy holiday season and a Merry Christmas to all their readers. And then the, the book is followed up. <laughs> it, it's a lot of fun. And the book, the book is uh, just followed up by a bunch of one and two page holiday themed gags. Uh, you know, real simple. 
uh, the ads in the book for the time, I mean, again, we're talking 1973, free Red China stamps from Red China, forbidden, what? forbidden for a generation. <laughs> then you have Sea Monkeys, uh, the famous Sea Monkeys. Of course. Uh, you could buy home movies, newsreel films of David Bowie, the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, Elvis, Chuck Berry, and Alice Cooper. I don't know where that comes from. And they can play on all your home Super 8 and regular 8 projectors. So, Eric, jump on that. You could also get any 15 records or any 11 tapes for $1.97 if yeah, I remember that ad. you join the Columbia Record and Tape Club and yes. buy 11 more. Uh, oh, and the tapes could either be cartridges, cassettes, or real tapes, reel-to-reel tapes. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Yeah. Reel-to-reel. Yes. And something that you would never see today, Little Jinx's Pen Pals. Okay, get this, Eric. There is a page. Okay. okay. It, it said something like, hey, kids, are you tired of being alone and not having somebody to talk to? Wouldn't it be nice to have a pen pal? Well, all you got to do is fill out a, an index card and, uh, or write a postcard to a pen pal. Uh, and if you want to be part of this, send, send us your name, address, and age to Little Jinx's Pen Pals. And in the meantime, you can you may write to anyone listed below. And there is oh a, my gosh, Eric, a list of kids, whether the oh. names, addresses, and ages. I kid you not. It was a different time, George. It was a different, it was a different, time. different time. Innocent. Oh my gosh. Oh man, <laughs> I couldn't believe it when I saw that. Anyway. This was a f- true Christmas grab bag. The one one and two page gags were all holiday and winter themed, and it was a lot of fun. I mean, I could, I could imagine picking this up. Or I probably got this off of a newsstand when I was ten years old or whatever, and just obviously barreled through it. I drew on it. I did the maze, and, and just had a lot of fun fun with it because it was a giant Christmas issue. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. well loved comic right there. Yes, that that is a very nice way to put it. Well loved. It's funny you, uh, you the 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 Jinx story where you you mentioned how they they basically turn to us and say Merry Christmas or whatever yes. it was right mm-hmm. where they break that fourth wall. Yep. Um, that reminded me, and this will be the last thing I'll bring up for from my side of things. But uh, uh, I, I, grade school, I want to say maybe fourth grade, maybe fifth grade. I wrote about Christmas time right before the Christmas break. Um. I don't know why I th- I'm sure it had to do with some, some class project, you know, everybody had to do something. And I wrote, I did, and I did this twice. I did it one year and I did it the next year. Um, but the story was basically, uh, I wrote a, uh, a Star Trek episode <laughs> Ooh. during Chris and it was set during Christmas time. Okay. And there were, had something to do with Orion pirates and some, you know, the ship was in peril and Captain Kirk takes care of it. And at the very end, and this is really all I remember specifically, George, at the very end of, of, of this, this, this episode, <laughs> quotes, episode, um, Captain Kirk and the entire crew turns to the audience in my story and says, we want to wish you all a very Merry Christmas or something to that extent. Oh, Eric, that's awesome. <laughs> Does that still exist somewhere or no? No, I no, I don't have. Yeah, okay, it. <laughs> but but for some reason that that just jarred my memory and and uh, that, that came flooding back. So, are, are there are there any holiday issues you're looking forward to currently? I know you go through DCBS most of the time. Do you have a lot of holiday issues in your upcoming order? Uh, this year, I I don't believe I I do. Um, in fact, I just got. Today, uh-huh. as we were recording record this, George, I just got all of my comics from uh, all of November or the rest of November from from DCBS, and I'm t- I was trying to think of. No, wait, there is one. I can't tell you what it is because I do. I just I just don't remember. I remember that you know going through the October previews, uh-huh. there were a few holiday theme ones, and um, I think I got at least one. I wish I could remember what it is. I should I should look that up. But but, you probably got, but yeah, got the I, DC special, I would guess. Oh yeah, that's it. That's the one. I'm thinking. Oh okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, yes, of course. I saw that. Of on course, the, I got the DC holiday. Yeah, yeah, I saw that on the rack at our local comic shop, Comic Logic. So that was up there. I saw Faith's Winter Wonderland from uh, Valiant. 
I know okay. IDW will have the Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck Christmas Parade, which I always buy. I love that. The one, the one I did buy is uh, Santa Claus Private Eye. I tweeted about it when I was reading. Right. It's by. I remember you doing that. Yeah. Jeremy Bernstein and Michael Dorman. It's by Dar from Darby Pop Publishing. Good. It, it it was a good buy. I mean, it, it's a prestige format. It was a uh, cover price fourteen ninety nine, but it was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and there's there's also that um, that Grant Morrison Klaus. Yes, a one shot, comic, right? Yes. There, there was yeah that one shot special. I almost got that. Mm -hmm. I, I actually didn't buy it, mm -hmm. but I I was intrigued. Yeah, a lot of good stuff, and, and there was a lot last year. Uh, the Power Man and Iron Fist Sweet Christmas Special. That was a good one. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, there was an X-Files Christmas Special that I bought. I think there's a Christmas Special in the Hellboy universe this year. Uh, That's where right. Where he meets Krampus or something like that. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. I almost bought that mm -hmm. one too. So the, there's always a lot of stuff on the stands. And you never know. Your local, your typical superhero books, every once in a while, throw something in there. Yeah. Flash, yeah. I think, had one last year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I I love I love uh, I love the the Christmas time holiday yeah uh, special comics that come out, which is which is really bizarre because if you ask my wife, um, she'll tell you that I hate I hate Christmas, yeah. which is not true. <laughs> Your birthday's around I do not Christmas. I hate Christmas. Your birthday's right around I just, Christmas. I hate winter, is what I hate. Okay. Well, that could, that's understandable. <laughs> <laughs> but but you can't hate Christmas. Your birthday's right around then, and of course, let me tell you, happy birthday right now, even though it's not here yet. But happy birthday to you. Well, and the same to you, because I know your birthday is also this month. Thank you. Uh, December birthdays have to stick together. Uh, every, right. Everybody asks, do you get chipped? Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say we get chipped, but some, maybe a little forgotten every once in a while, but that's okay. <laughs> may, I, may, may I ask you one question before we go? I know your listeners have sure. dealt with me uh, monopolizing your time, but I wanted to ask, do you follow Back Issue Magazine on Facebook by any chance? Yes. Have you noticed that over the past month or two, somebody on uh, on the page has been posting comparison photos of the new Teen Titans uh, and then the Prestige run that was uh, uh, the Tales of the New Teen Titans and the, the New Teen Titans Prestige issues and the Legion and the Tales of the Legion issues that correspond to each other. Have you seen those comparisons? I have not. I will go look at this right away. Yes, I think uh, it would interest you and, of course, Peter, your co-host on the Legion Project, and your listeners, because it's fun to see the comparisons of the two covers for the same stories. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, I, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I've I've been enjoying doing that, too, uh, uh, as, as Peter and I have been going through the—, the the Baxter run of the Legion. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's one of the things that I do when I'm reviewing one of our issues is that I go look at the, the newsstand version that, that appeared a year later mm -hmm. after the, 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 the Baxter version came out. So yeah, that's, that's been uh, a lot of fun too. Yeah, so I thought, of, thought of you guys when I was uh, checking that out because it would pop up in random in my feed and I meant to ask you about it, but I figured now was a good time to tell you about it. Plus your listeners can go check it out. If they ever want yeah, to. Yeah. yeah, they should. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Well, George, uh, thank you so much for joining me. No, no, thank and you. Talking, thank you because these Christmas comics. This show would not have been as, as long if I wasn't here. So, thank you. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate uh, uh, not only the uh, your time here tonight uh, as we talk, but but also for suggesting this specific format. Uh, uh, this is this is a lot of fun for me, and I hope our listeners enjoyed it as well. Um, so, uh, if and if they have, you know, I invite them to let us know. Uh, not only did, you know, specific things about what we talked about this in this episode, but if they have, you know, similar comics, like, like we chose, um, Christmas themed or Christmas cover, I can't, Christmas covered Christmas issues. Yeah. You know, this is one of those fool me once shame on you fool me twice. Shame on me. I, okay. Once right. one of the comics I, I, I mean, how many did I, pay? I, I originally only had the three. So really mm -hmm. my odds were not, I, if I got one that faked me out, but two that faked uh -huh. me out and how many out there are really like that where the cover isn't depicting what's in the book, right? Mm -hmm. If there's a Christmas tree on the cover, you'd expect at least a Christmas story in the book, at least the main least, story, yeah. right? Something to do with Christmas, right? How did I get picked two that were exactly <laughs> like that, where they had nothing to do with Christmas? Oh my goodness. So I apologize for that. And if we do do this next year, 
A, I promise to streamline my comments. And B, I promise that if I do pick up one and get hornswoggled again, where the cover is the only thing that has to do with the holidays or winter, I will not even mention that one and I will move on to something else. <laughs> All right. But, but like I said, I was like I'm saying, uh, if anybody has, they'd like to share their picks, you know, their, some of their favorites or, you know, maybe, maybe not, they're not so favorite Christmas comics. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to hear from people. Yeah. Um, and they can do that by emailing me at longboxreview at gmail.com or message me on Twitter at longboxreview. There are various other ways you can get a hold of me. Uh, if you go to longboxreview.com, you can find uh, those out. And George, how can people uh, contact you if they wish to do so? I have kept the Facebook page alive and well. It is George and Tony Entertainment. And the reason I've done that is because when whatever new project I am working on with other folks comes to pass, it is the optimum place for anybody to know about it. So please follow me at George and Tony Entertainment and or if you're a Twitter fan, George and Tony on Twitter. Currently not on Instagram, but I think I am going to be paired up. I shouldn't say paired up. There will hopefully be more than me and one other person on this new project. And hopefully at least one of those other people will be very tech savvy and very social media savvy and they'll get us everywhere we need to go. But for now, <laughs> and I'm going to around the holidays, uh, blast out posts about past holiday episodes of the George and Tony entertainment show that I thought were fun. Uh, Good. I always loved it. One of the things I mentioned on episode 200 is I loved our holiday episodes, especially when we would have a secret Santa, we would play an iPod game where we would just randomly mm -hmm. pick Christmas songs. And Tony would make fun of my my taste in music. So those are always fun. And, of course, anybody could just grab those uh, from our archives. But I'll, I'll be posting here and there. Of course, I'll be posting about this episode uh, on George and Tony Entertainment on Facebook and George and Tony on Twitter. So thank you very much. Yeah, excellent. So I, I'm, I'm, I was pleased. I'm pleased to hear that because uh, I, I, I'm, I'm also anxiously looking forward to whatever your next project is, George. So, and uh, just to let your listeners know, I begged and pleaded Eric to be a part of this new project, but Eric is a very busy man. <laughs> but just like he guest hosted on my last show, I am hoping to at least get you, Eric, to be a guest on this show every once in a while and give us some information and insight on the comics you're reading at whatever time that happens to be. It would totally be my pleasure, George. Thank you. Of course. All right. Uh, uh, once again, George, Merry Christmas to you and your Thank family. you. Same to you and enjoy your birthday later this month. Uh, and uh, you as well. And uh, to, to our listeners, uh, I say uh, Merry Christmas, happy holidays, all that good stuff. Uh, uh, keep warm and enjoy your time with your friends and family. That's that's the most important thing, of course. And with that, I will talk to you guys next year, I'm sure. Bye-bye.